Today, we are joined by a very special guest, Brian Shea from Game Informer, to tell you why Takeshi Tezuka is Nintendo's secret weapon. He's the best. That's right. When you think... When you hear people saying, oh, you know, who's the guy behind the Mario series? You obviously think Mr. Miyamoto, and yes, he's done so much in creating Mario, but Mr. Tezuka is really the little engine that's making it go. I know, he has like so much chill, maybe too much chill, because he's like so low key that I don't know if a lot of people realize his amazing and important contributions to the Mario series. So we're going to talk about all of that on this year podcast today. Yeah, and Brian's been playing the game, talking to Mr. Tezuka, so he's the perfect person to join us. And we just hang, hung out with him at PAX, so I said, let's come on the podcast and, and talk about all this. Yeah. It's going to be great. Yeah. Yes, it's going to be awesome. As always, everything we do on this channel is made possible by our wonderful Patreon family. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all of the support. You get tons of cool benefits, tons of stuff like early access and our weekly bonus Q&As, all the juicy secrets that we spill in our exclusive Discord. So join us at patreon.com slash Kit and Krista. As I always say, you know, if you tend to listen to the podcast first thing on Thursday and say, hey, I'm, I'm one of the first people to listen to the podcast, I regret to inform you that you are wrong because we <laughs> upload it early for all of our Patreon subscribers. They're listening to it at a minimum 24 hours in advance. And a lot of people finish it up and have a great conversation about it by the time it's even out for the public. So that's just one of many, many, many wonderful benefits that our subscribers get. Oh, yeah. Uh, you guys might have noticed, but I'm somewhere else. We're not together. Yeah, obviously. this is one of our. Are... This is one of our great international episodes. So where the heck are you and what are you doing? So I am on a big trip. I actually went home to my hometown of Tindu, China. I actually was born here. So this is truly my my home. My family's all here. It's been over f almost four years, I think, since I've seen my family and been back. Usually I come back like every couple of years or so. So this is definitely the longest time I've been away um, from seeing my family in my, in my hometown. So... I'm back here. I've been I've been loving it. Here it is behind me. You can see a little bit of the great sky. view. Um, great view, great view. City is so. Oh my gosh! Every time I come back here, I'm just like, wow, they built so much more stuff, and it's just amazing. But I've been having a great time eating all of my favorite foods and spending a ton of time with my family and my grandmother, who's turning 98 next year. So it's been awesome. I've been loving it. Now, we had a fun conversation of like, you know, what is the right time for us to record this, which led me down the rabbit hole of time zones in China. And I yeah. have to say, I am still reeling from the revelation that all of China, this massive country, has one time zone. Please explain this. I was so confused because when I came, I was like, I'll just, when, we, when I get to China, then we'll know like what the right time zones are based on what part of China I'm in. And then we'll discuss like the right time to record this. And then I looked it up and I was like, wait a second, that's not, that can't be right. And then I went down this rabbit hole of like researching why, cause it's so ridiculous that this huge country. And I, I guess when I was researching it, it was saying like, it's actually, it, it should, it should be like eight different time zones, but it's on one time zone. So I feel sorry for the poor sucker that lives like wherever, where the sun sets at 2 p.m. or like the sun rises at like 3 a.m. or whatever. I'm so sorry to you. That is not my experience here because I'm kind of in the middle of China, so I'm okay. But dang, that's rough. Now I understand why all the big cities are on the eastern part of China because that's probably where the, <laughs> you know, the time zone was meant to, to focus on. Yeah, it's interesting because I wonder how they deal with like, you know, international stuff when not, you know, like business stuff. Like how do how do those people in the in the bad times they just sleep at odd hours or like how do how does that work? It's ridiculous. But anyways, we're on one time zone here. It's so we crazy. figured it out. <laughs> we figured it out. It is my morning, your your sort of evening afternoon. And it's all good. It's all we figured it out. Our international recording continues. That's right. And you have been uh, exploring 
the gaming scene. You made a stop in Hong Kong on your way there. You've been doing that again. You're going to yes. work on a great vlog, just like I did when I was in Taiwan. And uh, that's one that yes. I'm very excited to see because, again, I have no hand in this. I won't see it at all before it before it goes live, yeah. probably. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah, it is. It is very exciting for me to explore what the gaming scene is like um, in Asia. Like, like you were saying with your Taiwan vlog that you did, which I loved, um, is that like when you think about gaming in Asia, you t you typically think about Japan and maybe a little bit Korea, but you don't think about some of these other countries um, and what they're getting up to and what the gaming scene looks like. But it is so vibrant, um, the gaming scene. And I just found so many like really interesting, I don't know, like the, the way that they, they, you know, these, these countries like look at games or play games or interact with games is so different. Um, so I found tons of really cool things in, in Hong Kong. I'm going to be exploring more in Tindu. Um, and then I'll also be off to Singapore later um, on this trip. So I'll probably try to poke around there a little bit too. So you guys are getting like the, the, the gaming tour in Asia, which will be fun. It's been fun for me. That that video is still, you know, a week or more away because you got more to see. But a video that is out now and has people talking is our 2D Mario tier list. I can't believe this. When we made this video, I thought this is going to be fun. We're going to have a great conversation about these Mario games. It, no. came, it, it, it turned into a drag out argument about what games like even hour. belong on the list. I can't believe it. First it of all, was, how dare you? I'm still a little bit <laughs> mad, honestly, at you. A little bit. You're you're lucky I'm really far away because I kind of want to hit you. Um, I was just like shocked from the beginning at your disparaging remarks about Mario. I couldn't believe it. You are like Mario's number one fan. And I was like, I cannot believe these are the ratings you're giving these games. It's just unreal. And then we got into a huge fight about whether or not um, Yoshi's Island is a Mario game. A huge fight. So when I was editing the but video, but not just that. Also, just like, also Mario Maker, also Super Mario Run. You know, come come for those fireworks, but stay for the very good uh, conversation where we rank these games. You know, I'm like George Washington. I cannot tell a lie. So I've got to say, what the <laughs> truth is about some of these Mario games, and some are better than others, is the fact you just want you just want the list to be S S S. For every single game, I but I regret to inform you again. Not true. I don't. I have very reasonable expectations, but your disparaging comments about this about this great franchise, I will not stand for. It is not okay. I was so mad editing that video. I was editing on the airplane, and I was like, this, this, this is so mad. <laughs> Well, that is the thing is you as the editor of all these videos, you do get the final cut like that's if you're directing a movie that is always like what you hope to get the final cut the final say so that you don't have to put yes. out your silly like director's cut later. This is the Krista version of this video. Wait for my version when I buy the rights from you <laughs> in 20 years. <laughs> when you learn to edit a video, you can I'll do have my revisionist history. Cut. Yes, it'll take me that your, long. Your, your opinions are on the cutting room floor, that's for sure. Oh, took the shears to it. <laughs> uh, so, so that's out now. You can check that out. Um, one other thing that happened uh, last week while you were gone was we got confirmed as speakers at the Portland Retro Gaming expo which is super oh, yeah. exciting because that is a show that we have both wanted to go to for a long time found a way to happen we're doing a talk on october 14th which is saturday there if you're at the show please come out and see us and say hi if you can't make it like we did with our pax panel we're going to be recording that and uh, inserting that into uh, a future episode of the podcast so it's, it's going to be wonderful I can't wait. I've been so excited about going to this show. I've been so interested in going to this show. So I can't wait. And if you guys, yeah, if you see us there, we'd love to say hi. So don't be shy and come, come say hi to us. We'd love to meet you. That's right. All right. That's enough of this uh, upfront business. Let's have our great conversation with Brian Shea about Takashi Tezuka. Here we go. We are joined today by a very, very, very special guest and our good friend, Brian Shea from Game Informer. Thank you so much for Welcome. being here with us. 
Thanks for inviting me. I've I've loved the podcast, and you guys came on my show, All Things Nintendo, yes. right after you had left Nintendo, yeah. and you teased me like there might be something else that we're going to be getting into very soon. So keep your eyes open. And then lo and behold, this is the show, and I'm I'm so happy. I, I love the show, and uh, you guys have been doing a great job. I am excited because our last couple of guests, I've started off the interview saying, "Have we met?" And I don't have to do that with you because we literally <laughs> saw you like a few weeks ago at PAX and Nintendo Live. So that's great. Yes, we definitely yeah. have met each other in person. We've known each other for actually a really long time now. We obviously used to work very, very closely with you when we were at Nintendo. And it's been so nice to, you know, still be able to hang out and, and connect after we've left. And yeah, you're. I've been on the show multiple times on your show. You have. And we've had a great time. So now it's finally time for you to pay up and come on ours. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here. So thank you so much for the invite. So we really want to talk to you today about Super Mario Brothers Wonder and Mr. Tezuka, but just just to get people started, um, maybe learn a little bit about you. How did you get started writing about games? Oh, wow. Uh, we're going way back. So this was probably 2007 was... Uh, I was an RA in college, so anybody who got in trouble in their dorms uh, has people like me to thank for that. <laughs> uh, but basically, that led to me having a lot of time where I had to just be in an office. Like, we had office hours that we had to, like, be downstairs in an office in case, like, the residents of the dorms needed us. So I just had a lot of extra time on my hands. And sometimes I'd bring, like, a movie to watch. But then, like, I started just, like, writing about music on in my free time. So... I started a website with a friend and it was just a, a, like a rock music website. And it was originally, it was just like message boards. And we were, I was just like, you know, I think we could probably do some more cool stuff with this. So, uh, and this is really going to show my age. I started reaching out to musicians on MySpace <laughs> and asking them if they wanted to do like interviews with us. And we just did one interview a month. And it was just like something that like felt really cool to do. And I had a great time with that. And then I was like, you know what? There's this, like, the Circuit City by me, again, to show my age. The Circuit City was going out of business but in my college town, as, as all of them were at the time. And so I went and picked up uh, one of the hot new releases, Fallout 3, on, on like their liquidation sale. And I was like, I heard good things about this game. So I played it, and I was like, I like that a lot. I've been writing a lot of album reviews and interviews and everything. I want to try writing a video game review. So I wrote a video game review. Of course, I loved it so much. I gave it a five out of five, uh, which was our scoring scale at that point. And uh, then, yeah, I just started I, because I was writing about music and I was really into games like Guitar Hero and Rock Band around that time as well. I started writing about music video games for a larger site that no longer exists. And then, uh, you know, from there, I started writing for smaller gaming sites, like just kind of day to day news stuff. And this was probably about. 2009 2008 2009 and then in 2010 i founded my own video game website alongside a friend that i knew from the internet and uh i helped run that and eventually became editor-in-chief of that up until 2014 at that time i was doing like freelance for like ign kotaku joystick um even biography uh, my biggest one was official xbox magazine i felt like i had a feature in their magazine like every other uh every other issue and then uh, on my fourth attempt at applying for Game Informer, I finally got the job and I started in early 2015 as an associate editor and I've worked my way up uh, over the last almost nine years to wow. now online content director. So that is the uh, the very truncated version. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if people incredible. I don't know if people realize like how big an outlet Game Informer is and you know when we were at Nintendo or anybody in gaming like getting a Game Informer cover is like the holy grail right. like can change your life. And... That is the New York Times of gaming, I think. Game Informer is like if you get featured in there and you land a feature story or a cover story like you are revered among your PR peers <laughs> as of landing the big whale. And know? I remember we would go through like, well, here's the biggest, you know, print circulation magazines in the country. And like, well, you start with the AARP magazine and not too far yeah. down, you have Game Informer. It's, like, <laughs> it's true. This is amazing. Like, I don't know how many people realize that, but like Game Informer is so instrumental in the way games get covered. Yeah, for a while there, like we were like the third most subscribed to magazine in the United States. Like, like you said, it was behind like AARP <laughs> and I think the Costco membership, which just <laughs> went out to anybody who was a Costco right. member. So it was like them, then us. And I think at, at one point, like 
uh, Better Homes and Gardens or something like that overtook us. And, uh, you know, we have uh, scaled down a little bit because a lot of people have opted to go for our digital subscription mm -hmm. and everything. But, uh, yeah, it's still, uh, I believe, far and away the most subscribed to video game magazine uh, ever. And, you know, we're still out here doing as much amazing content as we can, uh, both on in the magazine and on the website. And then, of course, we have our YouTube channel and uh, our two podcasts, one of which is the one that I host. So, yeah, we have a lot of irons in the fire, but our magazine is always going to be our bread and butter. It's amazing that there's still like a, a pillar print magazine, you know, like nowadays you think about how many people have moved to digital and, and there's all this, you know, there's been talk for years and years about like, oh, you know, is, is print still a thing? Is it going to be a thing that, you know, Game Informer is still, you know, doing all of that and then keeping that alive is pretty amazing. How, how does it feel to kind of be at a place that sort of is like the only place that has print um, these days. I mean, it's, it's kind of wild, right? Because like, you know, I, I did an internship, I think it was late 20, 2008, early 2009. It was uh, my senior year of college and it was with the local newspaper. And I was just writing about like the entertainment that was happening in the area. So like if a concert was going by, I would try to secure an interview with the artist that was coming through, or I would just like write up like, hey, this artist is coming through to perform a concert. And I remember on my last day, the editor who had been working with me told me, you know, the biggest piece of advice I can give you, just get as far away from print as possible <laughs> because it is dying. And, you know, unfortunately, we did see a lot of amazing magazines and amazing publications go under in the subsequent decade and a half after I left that that uh, internship. You know, the official Xbox magazine, I mentioned them earlier, it was a shame to see them go away. Nintendo Power yeah. is an obvious one where like, you know, that that was alongside Game Informer, uh, the ones that I read growing up, them, uh, EGM, EGM, yeah. Game Pro, all of those things were just like instrumental parts of my childhood. Same. And it, it's kind of heartbreaking that Game Informer is the only one that's kind of still left standing out of that group. But, you know, I'm beyond proud to be a part of the team that kind of keeps that up and running and keeps that legacy alive. Yeah. So you mentioned your podcast, That's All Things Nintendo, and you seem to have moved into this niche as like the Nintendo guy at Game Informer. Is that something that you sought out or did that, <laughs> that just happen? Because every every Nintendo we're at, you you are also there. And you're like, well, yes. I've, been, I've been here for two weeks because I'm doing this and that and that. Yeah, we often joke around. We're like, is Brian the only person working there? Because that's <laughs> all we see. Like you're just running around crazily covering everything possible. <laughs> Well, I think the two times we've run into each other have been the Super Mario Brothers movie premiere. Yes. We were both, we were, all three of us were there. And then uh, we saw each other at PAX, which I was also out there for Nintendo Live. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah it, it is very much the case. Um, you know, we, I, I did kind of slide into this niche as the Nintendo guy, but it's like, there's also like so many other hats that I have to wear. I'm also the sports guy and I'm also oh, wow. the racing guy. And I also... Uh, do a lot of our fighting game coverage. So it's just kind of a necessity. We do unfortunately have a smaller staff right now, so I do have to wear a lot of hats. But I think that like Nintendo has always been kind of one of the the main interests and the main driving forces of why I love video games so much. You know, my first console I ever owned was an SNES that I got uh, for Christmas after obsessing over my aunt and uncle's NES for like years on end. I, my parents probably, like, okay, this is something that we probably have to address. And I got a, uh, a Super Nintendo with Super Mario World for Christmas. Yes. So that was the first ever like console that I ever owned and you know, then obsessed over uh, Super Mario World, uh, Super Mario Kart, Donkey Kong Country. Those were my jams back when I was kind of first getting my console gaming. That, that just kind of persisted through most of my gaming life so like to be able to handle nintendo coverage uh you know primarily f for an outlet that i've loved the vast majority of my life it it's something that's very humbling and isn't something that i really take for granted yeah and congratulations i we just saw that um all things nintendo which is your podcast has crossed over 100 episodes <laughs> Woohoo! That's a big achievement. And we were just joking around about it when we were at PAX. We're like, hey, Brian, where are you going video? And I think it the 100th it episode is the, is the first one that you guys finally did video. So this is awesome. And it sounds like that has grown and is super, you know, super successful. So yeah, we're so we're so happy for you. Thank you so much. Yeah, the, the first episode that I tried to do like full on video, which was episode 100, I, I had some other things in mind that I was like trying to pull off that just didn't really happen for episode 100 to kind of make it feel a little bit more special. So I was like, you know what? 
we're just going to throw the switch and try to do video. Yeah, and yeah. I, I talked with you about it uh, when we were out at that restaurant. And uh, you were like, you totally should do it. And I was like, I've never really edited a video before. So it's going to be a learning experience yes. for the first few episodes. And you could definitely tell that in episode 100, the audio is kind of not great on my end. But we're, we're addressing those issues. And uh, the 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 way forward, I think, is going to be a lot easier, especially now that I've worked out like the basics of video editing. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel your learning pains and growing pains. But I'm <laughs> yeah, we're just so happy to see, you know, all of your 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 stuff growing. And yeah, it's a huge milestone. So that's great. Thank you so much. You know, it, it originally all things Nintendo started as like a column idea. I was just going to write it as like, okay, this is like every other week, it's going to be a column about what's going on in the world of Nintendo. And uh, our former editor in chief, Andrew Reiner was like, you know, why don't you do it as a podcast instead? And I was like, oh, I didn't really even think about that. But if I do a podcast, it has to be every week. It can't be every other mm -hmm. week because then like people will kind of like, you know, maybe fall yeah. off or something in between episodes or too much stuff will happen to like not be able to talk about it. And so I did that and I was like, am I really going to have like something I can talk about Nintendo related every sure single can. week? And so far there's, <laughs> there's only been a couple of weeks where I'm just like, what am I going to talk about today? <laughs> and, uh, you know, thankfully I pulled something off, like whether it's like a, a anniversary or something. Yeah. But I remember when I named the first file, cause you know, you have to upload it to like an FTP and everything. I was like, ATN 001. And I was like, because I'm going to put it out in the universe. This is going to reach triple digits. It's not going to fall go. off. I'm not going to get too busy for it or anything. Uh, and, you know, lo and behold, we made it. Yay! Well, here's to thousands more for you. You, you <laughs> certainly you. can't go monthly like certain other podcasts. But moving on. Um, <laughs> Burn! <laughs> uh, Super Mario Brothers Wonder. So this was kind of the centerpiece of our PAX and Nintendo Live weekend. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, generally, how are you feeling about the game after uh, you spent a, a ton more time with it than we did? Yeah. Yeah, I've played it multiple times now. I went out to an event in New York in August and got to play a lot more than what I got to play at uh, Nintendo Live. But I did get my hands on it again at Nintendo Live. So I've played a lot of these levels multiple times now. And I, I came away from that New York event when I really got to sit down and play it for like an hour straight, thinking like, this is the most creative a 2D Mario game has been since Yoshi's Island since the super nintendo I, I that's how i feel like you know i, I know there was a, a it's interesting because there was an 11 year gap if you think about the 2d mario games there was an 11 year gap between when yoshi's island came out and when new super mario brothers came out on ds and then similarly there has been an 11 year gap between the last uh new super mario brothers entry the wii u launch mm -hmm. title and when Super Mario Brothers Wonder is going to come out uh, next month. Yeah. So it's kind of like an interesting parallel in that regard. You mentioned, um, you know, you're going to New York, you have to play it for an hour. Can you tell us a bit more about kind of the circumstances of, of how you saw the game and how much of the game you saw? Because when we were there, you know, we were in line with everybody else. So the way it worked for us was we got to play what I presume is from the beginning of the game. We were in groups of four. I think the timer let us play for about 15 ish minutes. Mm -hmm. um, sounds like you got to see a lot more than that. Can you tell us like more, a bit more specifically what parts of the game you did get to see? Sure. So uh, let me actually get my notes oh. here. I got a oh, fancy wow. little notebook that I can open up here. Um, flip to my pages here. Uh, excuse well, the page. While you get sound that, effects. you mentioned uh, Yoshi's Island. <laughs> we will be returning that at the end of the interview. We don't want to get off topic, but maybe oh you can gosh. help us. Uh, <laughs> you and I might get debate. into you and I might get into a little fight, but it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. That's what friendships are built on: conflict. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, Yoshi's Island, I think, is, uh, you know, it, it, I think it's a Mario game. All right, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Wow. <laughs> and I believe also, I think I, I believe uh, Takashi Tezuka agrees. Oh, oh, oh there we go. Uh, From the top row. Dropping rope. a bomb. By dropping a bomb here. All right, all right, all right. Okay, let's, uh, well, let's talk about Wonder. So you, um, yeah, you play for an hour. What did yes. you see? Uh, I, I think maybe by the time like we got like started and got like the housekeeping notes out of the way, it was probably closer to like 45 minutes. But then to your point, I did play another 15 minutes at Nintendo Live. So I guess in total, it's been about an hour. Um, you know, I started out with a level called uh, Welcome to the Flower Kingdom, I believe. Yep, I think we played that, that one as well. Yeah. And as you would imagine, that is the first level. That's where you also get to see Elephant Mario mm -hmm. and Elephant uh, corresponding character insert name here. And I had kind of a similar reaction to seeing Toad turn into an elephant as I did that first time when Mario turned into an elephant in uh, the, the reveal trailer, which was just like 
complete disbelief at what I was seeing. Because <laughs> true, I don't know how did how did how did you guys react when you saw Mario turn into an elephant? Jarring, jarring experience. You, you took it worse than I did. <laughs> I just I, I'm so used to seeing Mario in like a suit that seeing yeah. the actual transformation, like the just the like body bodily you know deformation from body horror. Ma- Mario to actual elephant like I was so shocked like I just did not expect that yeah like maybe he's wearing a cute little elephant costume you know that would have been I would not have had that reaction but and then you see all the other characters kind of do the same thing like morph into this creature um and then seeing them all on the screen at the same time like all four elephants was like oh my gosh this is this is a sensory overload a little bit, little bit for when me. It, <laughs> yeah. When it first got announced, my mind went to like, oh, well, what are the gameplay things you can do as an elephant? So I was like, oh, well, you got a trunk. You can maybe swing that around. You can shoot some water. You're big and heavy. Maybe you can stomp on things. And it, it, it's, it's kind of how they implemented it. So uh, I, I like the way it's done. It definitely feels different than other Mario power-ups or suits you've seen. Well, it's interesting that those are the three things that you said that like you could do with a, an elephant because that is exactly what, what uh, the director of the game, Shiro Mori, says that those were what they wanted to accomplish with this this power up. They were like, you know, we wanted to have a character Mario grow in size. We wanted to have it so he could swing his trunk and attack things from the side and access like blocks and everything like that, like destroy blocks from the side and then also spray water. So yeah, those are the exact three like tenants that they wanted to accomplish. And they were like, yeah, well, we thought about that, and they're like, obviously, an yeah, elephant the only choice. It, there's only one, right, that you could yeah. really do it with? Yeah, so <laughs> make makes sense. Yeah, so I played that level, and then that was the first time I also experienced a wonder effect, which is basically like Mario goes on a psychedelic trip, yeah. <laughs> and it uh, it transforms the entire world around him. The pipes, in, in this first level, the pipes are going up and down. And then there's one that's like an inchworm that's like kind of like yeah. going through the stage like that. It's like a fever dream. Mario's having like a fever it dream. Really is. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, though that was like a fun first level, like a nice introduction. It's not like a, a a challenging or like too jarring of a wonder effect. And then of course, like what you do at the end of those wonder effects, your your goal is to find the wonder seed, which is like the main collectible mm-hmm. of the game, basically. And every Every level has at least two wonder seeds. There's one for completing the wonder effect and then one for finishing the level. And then some of them actually have multiple uh, additional wonder seeds based on uh, if they have multiple exits. So like think like Super Mario World, there's multiple exits on some levels. That's really cool to see them bringing back that concept and making it so that you can also get like multiple exits and that's how you can kind of get extra collectibles of this wonder seed. That's my favorite part about, and I think you and I share um, our love for Super Mario World as our favorite game of all time. I think you and I have that in common, which is great. It's not my favorite game of all time. Oh. It's my favorite platformer of all time. Okay, I Brian. would say Breath of the Wild is my favorite. Oh, game you're really that we, Brian and I have more in common than you. Thought. Okay, well, <laughs> Brian, you're fired. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, I think we both really love that game. And, um, I think one of the things that I kind of noticed when I was playing Super Mario Brothers Wonder 2 was like, there were some similarities with this discovery aspect of Super Mario World. And yeah, just hearing you talk about like the the ability to have, you know, different exits and these different little secrets to explore and discover, like that makes me really happy because that was one of my favorite things about Super Mario World. And I'm wondering when they were going to bring that back to a 2D Mario game and, so it's it's nice to know that they they really like took that and brought that back into wonder. Yeah, and I only got to play one level, that, at least that I know of, that had multiple exits, and that was a level called Bull Rush coming through. And yeah. I believe you two played, played that, that as well. As well. Yeah. And that's another one of those ones where like you know the the wonder effect really alters everything in a more substantial way. So like you know it, it creates a stampede of the bulls coming through. A lot of people have probably seen that in the trailers. Um, but yeah, basically you just have to jump on and, and ride, ride the stampede as it tears through the rest of the level and it, it ends up destroying one of the flagpoles. And in doing that, you can go past that flagpole right. and then reach a second flagpole, which is the secret exit, or I guess secret exit. I feel like it's it's more secret to go to that first exit because of course you're going to grab the wonder seed or the wonder flower, right? Right, right, exactly. So yeah, that that is, um, that, that's really unique the way they implement that and I'm, I'm glad that they're doing stuff like that they're really taking chances with this game it feels like and they're really kind of going at it in a unique way that makes it so that this is this game 
feels like it's a Mario game through and through, but they're taking it almost the way Odyssey felt like a Mario game through and through. It felt it felt like the the next evolution of what started with Super Mario 64, but still at the same time, you're like throwing your hat and capturing all these different creatures that play unlike anything we've ever played in a Mario game. But still, at the end of the day, you're like, yeah, that was a really fun Mario game. That's what Wonder feels like it's doing, where it's like there's a lot of gameplay mechanics and a lot of just interesting scenarios that you would never see in a Mario game up until this one, but it's still definitively a Mario game. So you mentioned that in addition to playing the game, <clears throat> you had the chance to speak to Mr. Tezuka and Mr. Mori. Was that part of you know the package of, of this trip to come out to New York? You get to play the game, talk to these people. Um, was it, was it something else? How did, how did that opportunity come up? Yeah. So uh, when I went out to the, um, the New York event, basically they were like, Hey, you know, Mr. Tezuka and Mr. Mori are going to also be in New York. Do you want to stay in New York over the weekend and then talk to them on Monday? And I was like, I just don't, I don't know if I can really swing that. So they're like, all right, well then come out to, uh nintendo live and they'll also be there so that was my chance to talk with them so it um you know it, it ended up being uh just kind of a quiet tucked away conference room above nintendo live like literally like in talking to them behind them you could see the show floor yeah. and everything i know that we room know well. that room well we've been in there a <laughs> yes. lot of times for packs. they love using that place it's like a secret little hallway up there it is. And it's interesting. Whenever like you interview like these Nintendo luminaries, like Mr. Miyamoto, like Mr. Tezuka, um, you know, you always get just the entourage in the room yes, as well. <laughs> they you roll know, they, so deep, right? They got they so do. many people in there. Especially when I was uh, at the, the following the Mario movie premiere, I had the chance to interview Shigeru Miyamoto and Koji Kondo together. So, you know, they each have their own translator. Mm -hmm. Uh, who, you know, so that way it's, 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 it's much appreciated by the way, because then they have their own individual voices talking right, for them. Right. So when there's like some back and forth, the translators are actually going back and forth as well. And it's really easy to tell who was saying what it's not like the translator saying, okay, then Mr. Miyamoto said this. And then Mr. Kondo said this. And then sometimes like it, with other developers I've had it where like multiple people are talking and only one translator and they don't catch necessarily everything. Specify. Yeah. Yeah, they don't specify who's saying it, so I have to like go back and like listen. And be like, all right, is that so and so talking, yeah, or confusing. is that the other the other guy? Um, so I, I really appreciate that with the approach. But then there's also like you know multiple PR folks in the room, and then also like other people who I don't know who they are, but they're just there. The NCL, I'm assuming they're the, important. Yeah, Nintendo, the Nintendo, ask them to leave. Nintendo Japan people that are <laughs> yeah, they like they they have a lot of hangers on just to. It's very protect. I always get like they're very protective. You know, like when we were there, mm -hmm. it was always like protect them, like. Obviously, yes, you know, but what are you gonna do? I don't know. I'll <laughs> jump on Brian and like put a hand Fall over his mouth and <laughs> tackle, <laughs> tackle you if you ask any question out of line. No, just kidding. But yeah, it's always like, oh, we gotta make sure they're okay. It's like, well, what do you think is gonna happen to them in here? Like, they're just talking. Um, but yeah, they, they do. It is a little bit intimidating when you walk into that room and there's like 20 people in there, and then you know, the two of them sort of in the midst of all of that. <laughs> It's interesting, yeah, because like I, you know, I'm used to it by now. But every once in a while, like when I do these like high profile interviews with some of these these luminaries, the PR person will be like, "Hey, just so you know, there's going to be a, like 20 people in this room when you walk in, so like don't be caught off guard. Just like you know, just expect that when you walk yeah. in. Like that that heads up is always appreciated, but also I think at this point I'm kind of conditioned to yeah, it. Yeah, totally. And you said that you've met you know uh, Tezuka San multiple times, and so you're probably kind of familiar with him. What did you think when you saw him this time? How was his how was his mood and how was he he was taking it all in? He was on like a little bit of a US tour, I guess, for a wonder. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean he seemed in very good spirits. He was joking around. Um, you know, we, we got a picture together for an upcoming issue of Game Informer and you know, instead of saying cheese or whatever, he went wonder. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> so he, cute. you know, he's that, that's the thing about like people like Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka is whenever anybody's like, Oh, what is it like? What are they like in person? Like they, I always describe them as like, they're the exact kind of person you would hope has like either created Mario or worked on Mario and Zelda so from like the very beginning. Like they're just like jolly little guys, right? <laughs> like they're just like the, the most joyful and like just fun people to talk to. And like, they're not like, you know, they're, they're two of the biggest legends in the history of this industry. And they are also like, aside from, you know, entourage aside, they're extremely approachable as well. Yeah. Like in talking to them, like they, they 
I feel like I'm not like getting like some act or anything. Like I feel like that's who they are. Like I remember I was talking to uh, Mr. Miyamoto about uh, just kind of the success that Nintendo has been experiencing as of late in particular, like the past, like since the switch launched. And like, I was like, yeah, you know, like you've had like the super Mario brothers movie. And like, at the time we didn't know how well that was going to do at the box office, but like it, by all accounts, I had seen it at two times by that point. And I was like, you know, it's a very good movie. Like everybody's, I think is going to love it. Everybody at the premiere seemed to love it. Uh, you know, the switch is selling gangbusters. You're about to have tears of the kingdom come out and you know, you have these, these universal studios parks launching and you have the Lego collaboration. And I mentioned the Lego collaboration and, you know, uh, Mr. Miyamoto, I think understands a lot more English he than, than he, he lets on. Absolutely. I, sometimes he'll answer questions that I ask him without waiting for the interpreter, yeah. but like, he um when i mentioned lego like he got this big smile on his face and it's like it seemed like something that like he was really proud that they were able to to get kind of uh, one of the collaborations they were able to lock in and mr tezuka was also very closely involved with that lego project i recall you know there's that saying like don't meet your heroes because they won't ever live up to what you think and and actually in my life i've actually avoided meeting people i admire because i was worried about that but with all those Nintendo developers, all the ones we met over the years, I never experienced that at all. And there's just something special about the mindset there yeah. where nobody gets a big head or nobody thinks their accomplishments mean they're more important than somebody else. It's just a very unique mindset that is so special when you finally meet these people who are legends. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it, and it, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I think, you know, it, says a lot about sort of the legacy as well. Like, I think the reason why they've been able to do this for so long, it's like, plus, you know, almost near, nearing 40 years, I think, for for those two, Miyamoto and Tezuka, is because they have such like a pure kind of heart when it comes to this. They truly are doing what they love. And that shows through um, just in their, you know, personalities and, and in their everyday work. And yeah, it just makes it, it, it does, it makes it feel like, this is truly something that you are meant to do and you're doing it. It's not like some act or like some force, like someone's like twisting your arm to do something. It's like, yeah, you believe that this is what you were put on this earth to do and you're doing it and it makes you happy. And that's like an amazing thing when someone is able to find that and do that for so long. And it extends to uh, people far beyond uh, Mr. Miyamoto and Mr. Tezuka. Like, you know, I, I mentioned Koji Kondo was in, in that interview with that, that I had with Shigeru Miyamoto, and he was an absolute delight. That was actually my first time meeting him. He doesn't do a ton of media, so shy. It, it seems. Yeah. But he, he had a good time with that interview. Uh, that I've only met Eiji Aonuma once in person. I was supposed to interview him in New York for Tears of the Kingdom, but then unfortunately I caught COVID right before that interview. So we did it over Zoom. Um, but you know, he was, he's been great both times I've interviewed him and then, uh, even Charles Martinet, you know, I know he, he recently stepped away from the role of voicing Mario, but he was somebody who did not disappoint in any way either. When I, when I met him a few years ago, I remember a fun anecdote with Mr. Tezuka. It was years ago when at E3, we used to do the Nintendo, um, round table, the developers round table, which was like an after hours thing for a very small group. And it was Mr. Miyamoto on the stage and he was, <clears throat> He got asked a question about, about, I forget what the game they were highlighting was, but he got asked a question. He's like, well, this, this was inspired by the flying uh, mechanics of Raccoon Mario and Super Mario Brothers 3. And come to think of it, Mr. Tezuka helped, you know, he, he created that mechanic and he's here in the audience today. So let him answer this question. He like pointed to him and he's like, answer this question. And he, somebody <laughs> handed him the mic and he very like embarrassedly and sheepishly like stood up and answered the question. And people were like, oh my God, this guy was just in the audience. Like nobody had a clue at all. And it's yeah. just like, we're, we just, we're just surrounded by legends at, at all times who have done amazing things and created experience even, yeah, you never that have know. defined there's, our lives. They're so humble. That almost, yeah. <laughs> that almost reminds me of the first time I ever interviewed Mr. Tezuka. It was unexpected because it was a Yoshi's Woolly World or uh, interview. And I remember it was like one of the planners, uh, Emi Watanabe was oh, Emi. the- the person that was put forward as like, you're going to be on the phone with Emmy Watanabe. And uh, I remember we had some tech issues like on NCL side where they were like having a hard time with the conference phone or something. Imagine that. So we're sitting there and I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of voices all talking in Japanese, obviously. And 
then like they finally got it worked out and like i i just assumed that the uh the male voice in the room was either the interpreter or like the it guy or something <laughs> and then it stayed in the room and the interpreter goes okay well we have miss watanabe and we have mr tezuka in the room right now and uh you can start your interview and i was like wait miss tezuka's here mr tezuka's here and like it was just like I was originally, I was letting uh, our intern at the time handle the interview and I was like just sitting in on it to like make sure everything went well. And I was like, oh, maybe I should like throw some <laughs> questions in there too. Because like <laughs> things just got a lot more serious. Yeah, yeah. He's so, he is so low key. Like for someone that has just been instrumental in what we know to be like the core tenets of Mario and, and the imagination and the you know, the joy of Mario, he's so low key. He does not like have any kind of, you know, desire to like get out there and, and, and you know, make himself um, the hero or, or the spot in the spotlight or whatever. Um, I remember when I first met him and like, you know, I really wanted to tell him that I, you know, my favorite character of all time is Yoshi and, you know, he created Yoshi. So I really wanted to tell him that. And I remember when I told him, he was like shocked. He was like, why? I'm like, why not? <laughs> He's like, out of all the characters, that's your favorite one. Why? I was like, what do you mean? Why? Um, so it was just like, he doesn't even realize, you know, just how incredible and what a genius he is and he's just like so just like oh i'm just living my life you know making these cool things and i don't even think twice about it it's it's really incredible i think my favorite interaction with him was when we did our rapid fire interview at i think it was e3 2019 and uh our former video producer ben hansen now the the head of min max over there he was had, he was running it and I was recording. I, literally, we only had one camera, like one professional camera. So he he put my phone on certain settings and he's like, all right, you just hold this camera <laughs> pointed at me as, as much as like closely and stilly as possible. And then we'll put like the professional camera on Mr. Tezuka. So we did that and, you know, I'm holding it. My arms are like screaming because I'm holding the, <laughs> a phone as still as possible for like, I think it took like 45 minutes. And there was a moment where, you know, with the whole conceit of the rapid fire interviews is like, you ask them kind of like, it's like maybe 40% informative and 60% like humorous. Zany. So yeah, one of the questions that Ben had a had asked Mr. Tezuko was, have you ever touched fuzzy, gotten dizzy? <laughs> and there was just no way to properly translate it. So like I actually ben. retweeted this. I actually, so Ben had tweeted this out, this clip of like, you know, we, we edited the, of the long conversation out of like between the interpreter and Mr. Yeah, Tessica yeah. trying to explain this and, uh, you know, just trying to uh, like convey what Ben was trying to ask him. And it was just so funny watching the interpreter and Mr. Tezuko like get closer and closer to like what the actual meaning was. <laughs> and then after probably about like two minutes of like discussion, he just exuberantly goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that poor translator. What if he, like, what if he was like, no. <laughs> Ew. Ew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he's just, he's down for, for anything. I think our favorite memory with him was, was the last time we saw him really. Um, this was for Super Mario Maker 2, I believe. Yep. Mm. And Kit and I um, were at E3 and we had filmed uh, with a bunch of the developers. And for Mr. Chesica, we were like, okay, what if we made, what if you and I made Super Mario Maker levels and had him like judge them or just oh, like review that. them and like, I was so, I think I was the more, most nervous I'd ever been in my entire life. Like forget any kind of big presentation or like big professional meeting. Like that was it. If he tells me that my level was like sucky, I would have just <laughs> crawled under a rock and died. Like that would I don't been... know if he could do that though. Like that's not in his character to be like, this level sucks. <laughs> I don't know, but I was like so scared to show him my level like I was I so that, nervous and of course he that is you're totally right that's absolutely not in his character at all even if it was a sucky level he probably would never tell me that and he was so nice but he even said like so many specific things about like why he liked it and why this Aww. level design was good and I was like I have reached my epic this is it this is the peak <laughs> I'm so happy it was like well, I mean, the best thing ever that's the guy. That's the guy who like designed so many Mario levels in his life. Like, so many of the best levels in video game history. 
and you're asking him to judge one of your creations. So that makes sense that you would be nervous. I know. He definitely gave us like real feedback though. It was not like, oh, this is fun. It was like, oh, this mechanic that you've implemented here or the or the gaps between these jumps, it feels like a really nice length. Like he actually put a lot of thought yeah. into this thing that he totally could have just mailed in. Yeah, and then he was like, oh, maybe if you like did more of this here, like that will make it feel more cohesive. And I was like, oh, this feedback, wow. <laughs> Sp speaking of yeah. Mario Maker, like that, Seeing the levels that people make in Mario Maker, I do not consider most of those to feel like proper Mario levels because it's like yeah. it's like a crazy like race to get 19 keys or some some crazy puzzle. Like you do understand the amount of restraint that they had in making those levels. Like we're going to make this like really short and straight, sweet and really straightforward. And yeah, that's like his kind of like house style that he helped to create that is seemingly really hard to replicate but when you think about it it's so simple oh for sure and i actually asked him in this most recent interview like what differentiates like a nintendo made level from like a mario maker made level from just like a member in the community and i mean the the big answer it all boiled down to he gave me a very long very well-worded answer that i would never be able to do justice by parroting it out here but like it ultimately boiled down to is like you know we we have all these ideas we we don't throw out any like any ideas that get brought, we try out a lot of the stuff that, that we think of, but then it comes down to like taking the time to just iterate and play test and just make sure that we're drilling down into what the core of like, what makes this level cool? Like what is like the core gimmick of this level or what is like the core idea behind this level that we were hoping to accomplish and just playing it and being like, okay, this, this one little part isn't working and then like iterating on that part and just over and over and over again through like rigorous play testing and design meetings and everything. And it's just like, I don't think that most Mario maker designers are like really doing that. It's just kind of like, Hey, this seems like a fun idea. Let me just do my best to like put it together. And like, they're not really putting in the time. They're just like, yep, you can beat it. And there's like a part of the level that's fun and just upload it. And uh, you know, obviously restraint is a huge part of that as well. Cause like we could all just throw like, 99 Koopa Troopas on a stage and be like, oh, it's impossible to beat unless you hit this one little area. Um, so yeah, I think that that was a fun conversation to have with him as well in this most recent conversation. There was some amount of surprise online, I noted when it was confirmed that he was um, the producer for, for Mario Wonder, which I, I was surprised at that surprise because you know, yeah. he is sort of the guy who's in charge of all of the 2D Mario games, just like mm -hmm. Mr. Koizumi is in charge of all the 3D Mario games at this point. And I, I can't imagine anyone else sort of helming that. You you mentioned Mr. Mori as well, who's sort of a newer name maybe for some for some fans or for some viewers. Um, but I know he was the director, I believe, of New Super Mario Brothers U. What was it like to mm -hmm. speak to him? Oh, he was great. He he gave amazing answers. Um, he was also in great spirits. I, again, I've, I don't think I've ever interviewed a person at Nintendo who didn't at least put on a very friendly <laughs> face. Uh, I mean, obviously, maybe I left the room and they were like, that guy was a jerk or whatever. But like, <laughs> they've so. all been like very good sports every single time I interviewed him. And, and you know, Mr. Mori was the one who seemingly came up with the idea for... Uh, for kind of the wonder effects and everything and that and then he brought that to Mr. Tezuka and Mr. Tezuka was like you should do it in every level because originally the idea was like oh we're only going to do it for a few levels and uh Mr. Tezuka was the one who was like oh no you should absolutely do it for every level and then there was like a back and forth but like they they had a really great rapport like at one point uh Mr. Tezuka had mentioned that he was not able to complete certain parts of Mario Wonder and then Mr. Mori turned it around and was like, I was able to complete all the parts of Mario World. <laughs> <laughs> I do love, um, nowadays, there seems to be this nice pairing between, like, the OG dev, like, Al Numa and Fujibayashi is, like, the, oh, yeah. the new, not new, like, Fujibayashi's been around for, like, a long time, but compared <laughs> to an Al Numa's sort of... Um, uh, tenure, it, it is a little bit shorter, but it's sort of like they kind of pair, you know... Uh, Tezuka-san and Mori-san like together and you can see that they're thinking they're like thinking about the future like what can this look like um you know at some point some of these people are gonna have to retire um and it's good to know that um you know all of these like storied um legendary series are are in good hands and there's there's like a way forward for them which is which is really encouraging and that's kind of been Nintendo's trademark right like I asked um I actually asked Mr. Tezuka, uh, like, 
what is what is it about Nintendo that they can just continually deliver like such a high quality that like you know Mario is known for being like this is the 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 standard bearer for platforming games when it came out in 85 and then you know Zelda around that time also became the standard bearer for like the kind of action adventure game and then the same thing happened again when they moved on to like 3D like Super Mario 64 was the game that every 3D platformer of that era was trying to like replicate and then same thing for Ocarina of Time every other 3D game that wasn't a platformer was trying to replicate that we still use a version of Z targeting to this day on most 3D action games and i asked him like what is like the the mark uh, or what what is the the reasoning behind Nintendo being able to be so impactful and also still so relevant in most of its major franchises to this day. And he was talking about how like, it's just kind of been a combination of like, they're always bringing in new blood that the, uh, the old guard kind of mentors. He's just like, yeah, like the Zelda franchise, you know, at first, it, it, you know, it was me and Mr. Miyamoto. And then uh, at a certain point, Mr. Aonuma took it over. And then he has been kind of with the franchise ever since. And then for, the Mario franchise, it's been me. And it's like, it, it just kind of like those veterans, but then they always do kind of mentor the new blood. I mean, new blood. I mean, Mr. mori has been with Nintendo since the late 90s. Right. So it's not like he's like some new hotshot coming in, but they, <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're stepping into these leadership roles. Like you mentioned, Mr. Fujibayashi, he directed Skyward Sword, but then obviously the thing that a lot of people know him for is directing both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. And it seems like he works so closely with Aonuma yeah. in terms of like just kind of concepting the ideas. I mean, that's that's how Tears of the Kingdom came to pass. It was like uh, Mr. Fujibayashi had like this idea of like putting together like a, a cannon with using like the magnesis and everything and like the, the remote bomb and all that stuff. And then he brought it to Mr. Aonuma and he was like, we could do something with this. So like it's always been kind of in partnership with like the i don't want to say inexperienced maybe the less experienced people and these longtime veterans at nintendo yeah being at nintendo is an interesting thing because when when you're there at the company for so long you do start to like absorb the dna of the company you know that happened to us when we were at nintendo like it, it's something that you can't learn and you don't know um from the outside like you'll never know like it, you only know it if you're in it for that long to like really like osmosis through this experience and like have it just like seep into your your own DNA. Like it's kind of creepy, but that's how it works there. And <laughs> I think um, that that is how they are training up these new people is like these people, you know, the, the old guard has been there. They, they are the embodiment of that like secret Nintendo special DNA. And they're like mm -hmm. through them, you're like absorbing it. Um, and that's the only way you can learn that. And I think that's the only way those – magical experiences happen um so yeah it is really interesting and really unique and different than i think how maybe some other companies work and other development teams work it is like truly something that is like you, you just you can't you know formulate like a step-by-step -step process around it you just have to be there and and do it for many 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 years and like that's the only way and like they all like it's so wild how many high profile developers have stayed at Nintendo. I mean, talk uh, the, the conversation with Mr. Miyamoto, and Mr. Kondo, I asked them like how their collaboration has evolved over the years because they've been working together for so long. And like when Mr. Miyamoto mentioned like we've been working together for almost 40 years, yeah. it's just like it's insane to think of that right like that that's unheard of in this industry but like that's not even like uncommon like uh, you look at mr tezuka he joined nintendo in 1984 next year is his 40th anniversary yeah which yeah. It, it's just unbelievable how long these luminaries stay with the company like mm -hmm. it's it's the outlier when somebody leaves when then you look at like other companies in the industry and they are they're, you know, they're, we just ha we, we have studio heads leaving left and right, big time creative directors going to other companies. Like, you know, you, you look at like Ubisoft and it's like, oh, I'm the former director at BioWare or I'm the former whatever at, at this company. And it's it's like these these other developers just I don't know what it is about Nintendo, but they these like Nintendo just holds on to their talents so well. Yeah, it's a weird thing. I can't explain it to you, but I was I was in it. <laughs> it was hard to leave, um, but you you do get sucked into it. And yeah, I, I love the relationship between um, Mr. Tezuka and Mr. Miyamoto. That's like my favorite thing ever. And that is my relationship goal. Like if me, you, Kit, we can get to our like 60s, 
70s and we can be like friends and we can hang out and talk about games still you're on like episode 3500 of the <laughs> all things nintendo podcast and we're like at a retirement home together playing super mario world like wouldn't you just be so happy if that was ha- if we made it that far like them that would be freaking awesome Oh, I would love that. Let's let's plan on that. Let's make that our goal. Let's manifest that into the universe. Be sure to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll still be arguing if Mario, uh, if Yoshi's Island is a Mario game at like eighty five. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like like gumming pudding and and yelling at you. It's gonna be great. So yeah, going back to that topic actually. So I believe the answer that Mr. Tezuka gave was uh, Yoshi's Island is a Mario game, but it spawned a Yoshi series ah, out of that. I tend to align with that. But again, we need to get back on topic or she's going to get mad. We can't have that. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you had, like, you know, the start of every demo is, like, you get the official spiel from Nintendo, and that's the highly sanitized, like, gone through a million rounds of approval, like, marketing language. When you spoke to the developers, like, they often don't even know what that language is. Like, did you get any any sort of talk about the game that felt a little bit different or any other little tidbits that kind of went beyond, you know, the this is what everybody sees and hears about the game. I mean, there's always kind of like a little bit of that Nintendo like sanitization, right? Where it's like I'll ask something comparing to like another company, not not just another like specific company, but like a, like how does what Nintendo does differ from other companies? And the answer will always be like, oh, we don't know anything about other companies. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, okay. But like, you know, I, I think that it's more in those back and forths between because they they often do pair them up right like i mentioned like shigeru miyamoto and koji kondo uh when i interviewed eiji aonuma he was paired with hiramaru fujibayashi and then this one was takashi tezuka and shiro mori and when they start going kind of off script and playing off of one another that is when you get the best moments uh like when i was interviewing uh shigeru miyamoto and koji kondo and i asked about like the collaboration like you know mr miyamoto was like you know i've always tried to like ask Mr. Kondo to like go more in depth with like his like suggestions and just like, you know, he just won't do it for whatever reason. And then Mr. (laughs) Kondo chimed in. That's not true. (laughs) But just like those are the my favorite moments in interviewing like the kind of the the Nintendo legends is that when they start are when they're able to play off of one another and go off script, because, you know, obviously, if I ask like my first question for uh, Mr. Tezuka and Mr. Mori was like, what? was the original concept behind Super Mario Wonder. And obviously they knew that was coming, so they had a very prepared response. But when I start asking the unexpected questions of like, you know, what what is the the secret sauce behind Nintendo level designs, that's when, you know, you get Mr. Tezuka going, oh, that's an interesting question. I wonder what like the actual reasoning is. And then he starts kind of like, almost like a, a self introspection moment of like why is why are we like so good at this almost <laughs> like and then like when we do like the zany questions like um when i was interviewing mr nogami who the the creator of splatoon and i was asking him like actual like physics based questions about like ink? <laughs> yeah when when the inklings sink beneath the surface of the ink are they like becoming one with the ink and like kind of like, or are they actually like this is opening like a portal where they're going beneath the actual sidewalk or like, how does that work? And, you know, he just started like kind of spinning his tires in the mud and he just made like a joke of like, oh, wow, you're really putting it on me here. <laughs> like, and I think like once they start having fun with it and like get beyond like the prepared statements that like the PR people have probably said like, hey, they're probably going to ask like these five or right. six questions that's when you really start getting like the to the the core of like the really fun stuff that's why the entourage is there just it's like what happens I'm when sure you ask is, the yeah. Zelda team about the timeline and just get a blank stare uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to you <laughs> well brian it was amazing talking to you about mario wonder and mr tezuka and just catching up um if people want to find you online where can they do that Oh boy. Uh, almost every social media is at Brian P. Shea. Uh, it's S H E A. And then you can find me, of course, GameInformer.com, Game Informer Magazine. We have a ton of great stuff on the horizon. Uh, and then also you can find me on the All Things Nintendo podcast, which hits every single Friday. Cover news, cover previews, reviews, and then we uh, uncover some eShop gems along the way. So that is, uh, I guess that, that's all the places you can find me. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us. It was always good to catch up with you. And I'm sure we'll 
We'll see you soon at some Nintendo events since you're the only one working. <laughs> I sure hope so. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. Uh, again, keep up the amazing work. I'm glad to see you two still working together, even though you both left Nintendo. Always love the Nintendo Minute, and I'm happy that this podcast exists. And yeah, we're back. Whoa. Now. I never know. I Brian, never know. Brian gave us the factual information that... Mr. Tezuka considers Yoshi's Island to be a mainline Mario game. What do you think about that? I mean, I'm not going to oppose him, obviously. <laughs> I'm not the one that made that game. But I, I know there's some other documentation from Nintendo over the years, official timelines and such, and, and things that were printed in official Mario encyclopedias that say otherwise. But hey... I'm not going to it, it oppose the sort of, him. The sort of dodgy history that they have in, in documenting what is or isn't. So yeah. when we started telling our, our Patreon subscribers about this video and this argument, they started having their own debates. So we put, the, we put an official question to them, and we want to read off some of the responses because they're very insightful. The, ba the basic question is, what makes a, a, you know, a proper 2D Mario game a Mario game? And in the case of Yoshi's Island and Mario Maker, these two series where we had these big debates, should they have been on the list? So let's dig into these. Tay 120N64 says Yoshi's Island is kind of a special case since it's all the main Mario team working on it. I would probably include that one and not any of the later Yoshi games. However, I wouldn't include the Wario Land series at all, even though the first one is Super Mario Land 3. Nintendo often lumps Yoshi's Island in with the main Mario series, but never Wario Land. I typically include the Super Mario Maker games since Nintendo considers them mainline, but since they have non-traditional course progression, I don't think it's a big deal to leave them out. If you leave out Mario Run, though, that's just cowardly. Uh -huh. Good news for you. We kept that in. Wow. Yes. Ha ha. Wow. Saved ourselves. Uh -huh. Uh, Tay, Tay here was kind of... Uh, talking themselves into a knot a little bit with this one. I, I, you'd start to understand like how complicated this, this question actually is. Right. Uh, John Frisch just says, I was going to say that since Nintendo treated Yoshi's Island as a Mario game by calling it Super Mario World 2, it becomes a Mario game by default. But then I thought about how Wario Land is Super Mario Land 3, and it's hard to call that a Mario game. So maybe the goalpost is that a true Mario game both has Mario in the title and features Mario as a prominent character. That disqualifies Wario Land games and all Yoshi's Island sequels, but not the original Yoshi's Island. I think John is on to something here. John is definitely on to something. And that was sort of my original thought process when I was thinking that Yoshi's Island was not a 2D Mario game. Because Mario, although you can play as Mario for small portions, very small portions of Yoshi's Island, you're mainly playing, the playable character is Yoshi. Um, so my thinking was has always been like, if you cannot play as Mario for, you know, 95% of the time, then it's not a 2D Mario game. It's a 2D Yoshi game. But anyways, I do think... John what if you're playing Super that. Mario World and you're riding Yoshi the whole time and who, who are you actually controlling? Are you controlling Mario or are you controlling Yoshi? Makes you think, doesn't it? Let's move on. Why you Wahoo says, oh personally, we get, no, no. <laughs> we cannot, we cannot get on this tangent. Why you Wahoo, why you, why you, oh my gosh, this is so hard. What is wrong why with you? Why you, why you says, personally, I think you have to play as Mario for a bit to be a Mario game. Yes. Beyond that, it has to be a platformer to be considered main series to me. So as far as 2D goes, no, Yoshi and Wario are not Mario games. However, Mario Maker, being a platformer where you play as Mario, is indeed a Mario game. Uh -huh. Hi. Tuskoob brings a, a level head to this conversation by saying, after some impassioned discussion in the Discord, I think it's an entirely subjective matter. The status of every game can vary so much by opinion, and this is all thanks to Nintendo's lack of a solid stance on the matter. I think the choice on their end to include spinoffs over the years and make lists based on a marketing first perspective is what caused this. We found so many lists yes. that had no consistency at all. Right. It was our fault all along. We were the marketing team. Well, we didn't make those lists. <laughs> <laughs> it's Nintendo's fault. Yeah, it is strange fault. that they cannot it is strange that they cannot get their story straight when That's it comes true. to this list. That's true. And finally, Zroid says, personally, I think the only one who should get to decide whether a game is a Mario game is Mario himself. Stay in your lanes, people. Oh, there Mario we go. himself. Well, Mario says two things right now. So 
there's that. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta talk to Mario. <laughs> and his response is, let's go. Let's awesome. Go. Cool. Thanks, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> Great insights, as always. <laughs> Uh, as we right. as we were dancing around this topic, we were getting perilously close into another argument. So I'm going to suggest that we move on <laughs> I think we to should. the games that we are playing. Let's check those out now. So my big question to you before you left, and a big question to, to each other whenever any of us goes on a big trip is like, what what is your travel game going to be? And you were telling me that you were having a good time playing through Sea of Stars. Yeah, I had a lot of good travel game options, luckily. I had um, Fay Farm, which I've been continuing to play, and it's perfect for that kind of like long stretch of time because you can just play a little bit at a time. But I was really excited to finally dig into Sea of Stars, which is obviously a game that people just talk about, and uh, it's like a darling, obviously, and I just haven't had time to really sit down and check it out. So... Now that I'm traveling and I have lots of flights and, and long, you know, long flights and things like that, I was finally able to check out Sea of Stars and I played the demo and I, I, I since have bought the game as, as well. But I love it. It is so good. Um, obviously, the game is beautiful and, um, you know, just, just the art style and the, just the style of the game in general is absolutely gorgeous. But I also really like sort of the modern feel to this type of to, to this type of game that I've noted in in Sea of Stars you know like everything feels really snappy um you're not kind of bogged down by some of the other kind of turn-based RPG type of um type of things where you know especially in battle lane stuff where it can become kind of a slog there's a lot more puzzle and it, like just interaction with the environment than I had realized before you sort of doing a lot of you know, environmental puzzles or, or your character has a way to like get up on ledges and things like that. So you're interacting with the environment quite a bit instead of just like, you know, you and your party just walking through it to the next battle. So that's been really cool. Um, the characters are all pretty interesting. It kind of has like a Paper Mario or a Mario RPG feel to it when, it when it comes to the battling where there is some sort of timing button presses that you can do and and cool, you know, combos and stuff you can do that with your party. Um, so yeah, all of that has been really great. I really love it. I'm going to keep going, but I'm so glad I finally got a chance to play this game. This is one that I've been very interested in too, but has just been a victim of all of the other games that are out. I honestly don't know if I'll be getting to this this year at all, but I'm really glad that, that you're getting a chance to play it. One of the things that I have heard and I don't know if you are far enough along to have experienced this, is that there there are some difficulty spikes where, where you are. Has it been feeling pretty okay as far as the progression of the difficulty? So far, so good. I did do a boss fight and it wasn't, it was not hard in the sense of like, I'm, I'm like one shot killed by this thing. More so hard in the, in the sense that like, I, I do have to like chip away at it. But that's a very typical sort of turn-based RPG kind of style. So I wasn't like taken aback by it. Um, I haven't run into any crazy difficulty spikes so far, but I have noted that the boss battles are, they're like, you know, it's a significant battle. You're going to spend a good, you know, 20, 30 minutes chipping away at this boss, you know? So um, yeah, so that that part of it, I, I can see why maybe there people are thinking like, oh, it gets, maybe it gets really hard later with boss fights. I don't know. Um, so far, so good, though. This game is also going to be, when I'm finally ready to play it, a good test. Remember a while back we did that that never a minute of, would you rather play a game on the Switch or play it for free on Game Pass? Yeah. This is this yeah. game is going to be a real test of that because the game is on Game Pass, but it's like, oh, this is a real good Switch game where I could see myself just sitting in bed and, and playing through it. And I guess I could stream it on my, my Steam Deck, but... If you had to ask me now what I would do, I honestly don't know. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I probably would have played it on Game Pass if I wasn't traveling, honestly. Oh. I, I think I think okay. I would have I would have preferred to do it that way, but I didn't have a choice because I was traveling. So Yeah. Um right, so I right. had to play it on Switch. I don't I'm not sorry that I have it on Switch. I bought the game, <laughs> obviously, after playing the demo. 
Um, but yeah, I think if I was home and I had time to play this game, like I had like sit down time at home to play this game, I'd much prefer to play it on Game Pass. But the Switch version is like, there's no like weird graphical issues or anything like that, right? Looks it's very clean. beautiful. Okay. Super clean. Good, good, good. Looks great. Yeah, no issues. Nice, nice. Uh, we are also both playing Baldur's Gate. We're going to come back to that. Uh, I got to go last week to a really cool event at Capcom uh, headquarters, which is just in San Francisco, so very close for us. They had an event uh, kind of in sync with what was happening at Tokyo Game Show, where people who, the unlucky few who didn't get to go to Japan could still play the games and the demos that they had there. And in some cases, they actually had more games or, or more of the games for you to see. So that was actually pretty nice. The big thing that I that they had that I really wanted to see was Dragon's Dogma 2. Um, three. I really like the first Dragon's... Well, I have it written as three in the document. That's wrong. It's two. Uh, oh. Oops. But... Yeah, so I played the first one. I couldn't believe that that game is over 10 years old now because when I think of it, like, oh, that came out like maybe five years or so ago. No, a long time, <laughs> over 10 years ago. And at the time, you know, this was kind of a big swing for Capcom. And I remember they were really hyping it up as like, this is our next big franchise. And we we're really, they, they strangely kept talking about we were investing a lot of money into this game. So you made it sound like, oh my gosh, this is like this make or break thing. Like, is Capcom going to be okay if Dragon's Dogma doesn't take off? And they seem to be applying some of the stuff they were learning with Monster Hunter, where you were fighting these big things and you could grab on and stab it in the neck, kind of like what you could do in, in some of the later Monster Hunter games. And it became this sort of cult, classic it never became i think the big hit that they wanted it to do so part of me was sort of surprised when they announced a sequel because i wasn't sure we would ever get a sequel but this new version definitely seems to be taking what they had with that first game and, and just sort of expanding on that i wouldn't say there's any like big new change or addition that they have made that makes it feel like radically different it's just like no this is like a fully implemented version of that vision, which is good because the first game felt limited by the hardware that it was on in a lot of ways. Like they had to actually, you know, letterbox, like put black bars on the screen because I think the graphics were so taxing on the hardware. So, and they, they did re-release the first one on the switch and, and even that one like had some issues. So I would say there's like never been, at least that I have experienced like a, a super great version of, of the original Dragon's Dogma. So it feels nice to just have it. Like I played it on the PS5. Uh, this game is, is so beautiful and amazing. I should say what the game is if, if people don't know. So it's sort of, you know, an open world, you know, proper medieval fantasy um, action role-playing game. And I, 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 I use that distinction because you know, there are other games like Oblivion that kind of have that same moniker, but the thing that sets this game apart is the combat, where in Oblivion or Skyrim, it's like, I kind of am not loving the combat and, and I'm sort of, you know, suffering through it because everything else, the world is so cool, all of the interactions that you can have are so cool, but, you know, this is like, yeah, Capcom made like a super tight um, action battle system in this huge open world um, action RPG. So that's really what sets it apart is, is the combat. And there's a lot of combat in this game. I was, I was a little bit surprised. So I got to play for an hour, whereas I think at TGS, people only got to play for 15 minutes. And a lot of it was following my helper. So you get these helpers that are called pawns and you sort of have one who is your main helper. And then there's others that you can hire along the way and, and they can have different classes um, that, that, that you can sort of build out your party how you want. And I spent most of my time just following the pawn along to this sort of bigger checkpoint. And I was just getting ambushed like left and right. So I do think that is something that does set this apart from some of the other open action RPGs is like, there is a lot of combat. They sort of know that that is their bread and butter and they're really like sort of playing it up. Have you played a, a dragon's dogma game? I should ask. I have not actually, and I've been at, trying to figure out like, and, and talking to you a little bit about your experience playing this one, um, because I know you've played uh, the first one as well, but I wasn't sure if this is a game that you think I would like, um, but I've never played this game before. 
I think you would. Um, you do really get, I, I mean, I'm really, the, the game is so beautiful. Like the draw distance is so good. The way that they have like paid attention to like the foliage and like the trees and the placement of like mountains and rocks and things. It, it is a Vista lover's delight and I am the number one Vista <laughs> lover out there. So I really, really appreciate that. Like you do get a great sense of place as you're going through this and like you might find a castle and you go through that and it feels like this big, grimy, dirty old castle that you can find. But again, the, the battle is the big differentiator. And there's a lot of different classes that you can choose from. I guess they have not yet released the full list of all of the classes. I was just playing as the, in the in the version I had. You could play as the fighter, which is what I choose. Obviously, um, there was an archer, and then there was sort of like a, a thief. And I was asking them, like, you know, what like what makes the thief an appealing choice in a game that's so action heavy? And they're like, well, you know, he's fast, and he you know he can wield. Um, you know, uh, different types of weapons and it's all about, you know, attacking quickly. So I guess I can understand that. You know, I don't know if the game is really about thieving or, or stealing <laughs> things from, from enemies or people, but um, I did get to fight some of the big enemies. I ran up on this sort of huge Griffin who I guess you're not supposed to be able to, to defeat at the point that I'm at, but it did sort of grab me in its claws and like smack, like, drag me along the ground oh. um, in an interesting way. So those big fights are, are very impactful and exciting. And I did actually also like hold on to it as it started to fly away, which was a problem for me because my stamina, my stamina ran out and I just, you know, fell to my death. Um, the demo <laughs> sort of ended with me infiltrating this big cave where there were all these goblins and I had to clear out these goblins, which was no problem. Um, but once I got out of there, I was like at the top of the mountain and I was taking this long sort of rope bridge to the other side and all of my pawns who are maybe in the, uh, not, not part of Mensa all fell off the <gasps> side of the bridge and oh, died. No! So, <laughs> and I was like, what do I do? What do I do? And they're like, well, you're kind of out of luck until you can get to a place where you can get more pawns. And that's when my time ran out, fortunately, because I would have been in a bad way without my my helpers. But um, yeah, those pawns are not, they're not super smart. They're not the uh, smartest. This game is not, they don't have a release date for this yet. I imagine it's going to be coming out next year. Um, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. We have way too many games right now, but um, this was this was a super fun thing to to play and check out and sort of sock away for like, yeah, this is coming out next year. Cool. Is it like Elden Ring level hard? battles like those big so, bosses are so good like question. that you know you know how like elden ring and all the souls game like all the combat has this sense of really like weightiness to it and it's yeah. like all right if i'm pushing the attack button i'm investing you know seconds into this swing animation the wind up and all of that like this is like a, like imagine like a Bayonetta type of game or obviously Devil May oh. Cry is Capcom's big action series. Think think of that that kind of action but in that sort of open medieval fantasy type of oh, that's setup. That's cool. So it is a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, I I wonder how people will take it cuz now there are so many games that are that are kind of going into this genre it's getting a little bit crowded. Um I I wonder, you know, will this be another cult classic? Um, on the other hand, not my problem. I'm going to be playing it anyway. So that's cool. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I got to check out at this event that I was curious about was they had, um, some of the resident evil games coming that were coming out on iPad. Uh, we talked about those last week after the Apple event. I'm not, I'm not going to be playing any of those, but I just wanted to see how they work. So they had resident evil village, um, which I checked out and they very smartly had, the iPad already set up with an Xbox controller and I played it with that for a little while. And I mean, you, you couldn't tell the difference between that or, you know, it running on like a PlayStation or an Xbox, like mm. the graphics were on point, ran super smooth. Obviously the controls were exactly the same. And I said, well, you know, what can I see as far as the touch controls? If you are literally just playing it on an iPad and don't have a mm -hmm. controller, and they said, well, we're focused on the controller experience now, which is which was a good response because I did uh, find in a menu, like kind of the overlay of what that would look like. And I don't know how 
feasible it is because it's like they basically have mapped an Xbox controller onto, you know, a dozen buttons on this iPad in addition to virtual thumbsticks. So, mm. uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. With I a mean, game I, like... You know, there's yeah. stories of like... There's stories of like, oh, kids these days, like they're they're the masters of, of virtual thumbsticks and it's no problem for them. But I, I looked at that and I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. With a game that's so action heavy too, like a Resident Evil game where you just need those Twitch like controls to work. I don't know how you could get through that game with that touch, the, the touch controls. I just don't understand. Like Diablo, I can get, I I get thought- it because it's easier. I just thought of the very basic action of like aiming at an enemy where it's like, I have to press the left trigger to aim down the sights and then I aim with the other stick and then I press the button to shoot and like, I'm like clawing on this. I would be clawing on this iPad to do it. So you need like 10 more say, fingers. Those, I know, I know. So I, I again, I, I checked that out as a curiosity, um, ran great. But again, with, if you're not having a controller, I don't know how good of a time that's going to be. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I checked out, and I am I am absolutely not the person to uh, talk about this, so I'm not going to try, but I want to ask you a question. So they had the new um, um, Ace Attorney compilation <gasps> for people to check out, and I played that in honor of you because I know you like that series, and I, I, I am so like not knowledgeable about that series at all, but the one that I played was not Phoenix Wright. It was mm-hmm. Apollo Justice, who yes. is a character I know. And I know they made games focused around him later on. So he was the lawyer. But in this case I was doing, your client was Phoenix Wright. And he looked like this kind of like down on his luck, ne'er-do-well. He was wearing like the knit hat. He was scruffy. And he was the suspect in a murder. And I thought, what yeah. in the world has happened? Does this does this make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah. They have a lot of games where they just like change up the characters. There, those the you know you get a, you have Apollo, you have Athena, you have Phoenix, you have a bunch of different characters that I think um, they change up. But yeah, there there is one of the one of the trilogies has Phoenix right as a suspect, and your your Apollo Justice. But is that canon player. that? That Phoenix Wright is like a, a down on his luck deadbeat? Like what happened? Well, you, gotta, to him? you gotta prove him innocent. There's something that happens. That's why the narrative of of these games are so wild. Like sometimes the narrative, the like the story stuff with these with these Ace Attorney games are just like jaw dropping, like gasp worthy drama. That's why I love these games, because you never know like what crazy antics they're gonna put these characters in. And why, like that, that's a good setup because you're like, why the hell is Phoenix Wright, you know, a down on his luck ne'er do well? And you're going to have to play the game to find out what happens. Fun, right? Are you can play it. It threw me for a loop. Um, <laughs> again, this is not, this is not a series that's really for me. I did have a good time with the, the small little chunk I played. It's funny though, because so, you know, the way they had the room set up was like there were a couple um, TVs on a table. And then behind us was the nice lady who was sort of overseeing us. And in the loading screen, I could see her out of the corner of my eye, like watching what I was doing. And I got so self-conscious because I just expected to see her just like. You're a dummy. I never did. I never did. But I was very self-conscious about that because, yes, I am a dummy. a dummy. I admit it. (laughs) I'm a dummy. (laughs) No, you always said that you didn't like these games because you were too smart for a Phoenix Wright game, for, for Ace Attorney games. Well, so in the in the one that I played, it was like I kind of knew a couple steps ahead what was coming, but I had to go through these other steps to get there. The one thing that, that felt a little bit slow to me in this one was like asking like the cross-examination on every single statement that yeah. they said. It's like, okay, I'm going to need to ask this on every statement, like, do I really have to press the button every time? I don't know. Might not have Again, to ask. I, I'm, I'm, I am not uh, an expert in these games. I don't dabble <laughs> in these games. I'm going to bail out before the uh, Ace Attorney Nation comes for me. They will come for you. Um, 
Another game that I got to check out, I got sent a code for actually, so thanks to the team for that, is a game I've had my eye on um, when it was on the Steam Deck and it came out of early access and is now on the Switch. It's called 30XX. Have you heard of this game? I have not, but I pulled a trailer for it for the uh, for this episode and I was looking at it a little bit. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so this is is so my best comparison point to this is so we have dead cells which is a roguelite which is heavily inspired by castlevania and they went so far as to make the castlevania dlc because it was such a perfect match for that what i would say 30xx is is that same sort of roguelite structure but set in the in the the thematic of mega man which is obviously mm -hmm. something i'm very excited for yes yeah so you know, the way it plays is you kind of going through these levels and you get randomly like different sorts of power ups and some of them are passive and some of them are active. Um, they do a really good job of matching the feel of what it's like to go through a Mega Man level, just like the running and jumping feels very much like a Mega Man game. Um, from the beginning, you have two characters that you can choose from. They're a little bit different in how they play but i did appreciate that and then you know at the end you do get matched up with sort of a big boss and um you can take them down and yeah like i i really like my dead cells comparison for this because that that it felt very much like okay they've they've done that to mega man um so it doesn't it you know it doesn't help the sting that there hasn't been a proper mega man game oh. in a long time but it, it is nice that there are people who love and are inspired by mega man making games of that ilk that feel modern and cool so i appreciate that about this game nice baldur's gate our big update <laughs> wow. baldur's how gate. quickly you're ready to move on to baldur's gate uh fine we can move on to baldur's gate so so this was one of the other big travel games for you because again last last week I gave you my backbone and I said, well, you know, maybe maybe you can luck out and get the remote play to work. It sounds like it's been working good. You've been playing more Baldur's Gate. My mind is blown, guys, with the remote play. Okay. If you were to tell your younger self, like NES version Krista, that you could play your game remotely in another country like literally the furthest country away from the u.s you could play the game that you're playing at home wow technology works um i'm shocked it works so well i have been playing every night um i hope my ps5 does not blow up at my house because no one's there um, did you take it, it out of that little cubby hole that you keep I took it? I took it out of the cubby hole. I took it, guys. Thank don't goodness. come at me. I took it out of the cubby hole, okay? It is very in a spot where it is getting lots of ventilation. Um, so please, please keep working, PS5. I'm sending you good thoughts. Um, but the, the backbone works so well. Um, I don't have the big iPhone like you do. I, I do have like the, the regular, you know, at the 14 regular size. So the screen is a little bit teeny um, and Baldur's Gate does have like tiny text. So that's my only complaint where I'm just like looking at <laughs> looking at I'm like, what am I? What button am I? What's a, <laughs> so there's there is a little bit of that, but no lag, no issues connecting. Um, I've been able to do like full on battles. The good, the good thing about this game, though, is it, it's very, like, kind of turn-based and it's not, no like, twitchy super stuff to do, yeah. twitchy action, like, which is great. And it's, it's almost like playing, like, chess, you know? So it, that's been working great. Yeah, so I've been keeping up with my Baldur's Gate after you disparaged me from, don't start this game. You're going you're gonna to not be able to play it for three weeks. Look at me now. It's amazing. Just wait. It. Until uh, the late night session ends with you hitting the button that says not go into rest mode, but turn off PS5. There, it's one menu away and all it takes is one laggy input for you to just turn the thing off and never be able to play again. I'm also worried because I keep playing this game in bed and I keep falling asleep. So I'm also a little bit worried that I'm going to oh. like play a chunk and then not save. Like it doesn't auto save or something and I'm going to lose it. So I keep falling asleep with that thing. The saving can be <laughs> dodgy in that game. The saving is very you do dodgy. Need to be careful with the saving. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So I'm a little bit behind yeah. you. Um, I have gotten through sort of the the part where 
there was a there was sort of a chunk in the middle of that first act where you do have to do a pretty significant like battling of just all of these goblins in this camp and I was like stuck in the dungeon where the goblins were for like a long time I felt like it was like this really like gross like dank dungeon I didn't like it and there's like spiders in there and I wanted to get out but I had to kill all these goblins it took forever so I'm finally out of that <laughs> I feel good <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think you're, you're quite a bit ahead and you're about to get into, you're like well into act two now, right? Yeah, I think I'm, I might actually be at the end of act two and, and act two actually feels very different from act one where act one was, you know, you're in this kind of very colorful woodsy kind of thing. And it's this very big, you know, open to exploration sort of area. Act two feels much more. Um, well, obviously just the setting is I've been in a cave. I've been in this sort of haunted area where it's dark and scary. And, and, and finally I've been in this massive, massive, like hardcore dungeon. And I was like, wow, this dungeon's hardcore. Then I realized, wait, the first thing is dungeons and dragons, dummy. So obviously there's going to be a big crazy dungeon, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, tonally it's very, very different. It does feel not quite as open. Maybe there are just more nooks and crannies that I have not been as invited to explore because it's kind of like scary and gross in places. But um, the game is getting pretty tricky. I have had to look at a guide a couple times specifically for this dungeon. I did finish the dungeon last night. I very nearly had a real rage quit moment uh, where the dice were not in my favor. Oh. So I was fighting this big boss at the end of the dungeon. And this is one of those bosses where it's like, you start by talking to the boss and it's like, Oh, how hard could you be? And then the battle starts and he spawned like 20 enemies with him. And it's like, oh, oh. I'm going to get rushed by all these little guys. And like, that can be a problem in that game. Yeah. And it was a real slog. It was like 30 minutes plus of battling. And I finally had him down to like one or two HP with my character, my main character standing right next to him. And I had three swings to take him down. Critical miss? Miss. Miss. And then the third one, I was like, you don't you dare miss. Oh, oh my gosh. And then he wiped me out. That was the last no. character I had. Game over. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. You had to do the whole thing again? I did. I had a different strategy this time. I went through that dialogue tree the same way because I was like, I am not, I'm fighting this guy and I'm beating him. I did it in much more efficient fashion this way, this time. Um, I did need to take just a breather after that because I was a little, I was a little worked up. You know, controllers these days are too expensive for you to just throw. Don't throw the PS5 controller. That's but I kind of expensive. aggressively set it down on the couch <laughs> and walked away for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's rough. So I continue to have to be in an absolute stranglehold with this game. And we sort of started to talk about this last week is, you know, it is um, making me very interested in Dungeons and Dragons as a whole. So I have now bought, I went on a shopping spree and I bought all of these books and I got the starter set. I got all this other stuff and I have been very diligently reading through it because I, you know, I'm finally at the point where it's like, I, I really, you know, I've, I've danced around this long enough in my life. It's like, I really want to hunker down and, and figure out how this works and like, just make like a real effort to try and, and just try it out. And there's just so much to get through though, but I've, I've sort of come to the realization of like, there's a lot that maybe you don't need to know or, or have down cold. Like they have a lot of different scenarios or a lot of edge cases where it's like, you know, if I'm doing a game, like, I feel like I could just say, like, yeah, we're not doing that. We're not doing underwater combat. We don't need to worry about that. Mm -hmm. But there, there's just, you know, there is still a lot to get through. Something I did do, which some people may laugh at, but I, I still think was um, a good idea, was I did get some books that were aimed at kids because I need the Michael Scott explain it to me like it's five lesson <laughs> <laughs> before Your I can get into some of these got really, you Dungeons like, and Dragons. <laughs> And that that has been helpful to like really break it down to a granular level. So I'm, I'm making my way through these books. Um, you have given me a deadline to be done with yes. it by the time you get back. I think I'm going to do it is basically what I'm saying. 
I need you to become a full-fledged dungeon master by the time I come back so that you can host me in a wonderful game of tabletop Dungeons and Dragons. So you have two more weeks. Get going. Good luck. Well, the joke's on you because you need to read all these books when you get back. So you you need to study this you stuff too. You have to too. teach me. <laughs> what I have to teach you? You can read you the books. You do. No, I don't want. I don't want to read the books. I want you to teach me. One of the big hurdles that I've had to like mentally get past is like. So I do think that Dungeon Master is something I would enjoy, but this aspect of like creating this game. Like I get worried of like, I really need this to be airtight and I need yeah. to think of all the scenarios. And it's like, I'm, this is like writing a book. Like I might need to like write all this down and have it ready. Mm -hmm. You do. So I, I got worried about that. But then I found like they do have these like pre-made campaigns where they sort of thought through a lot of that for you. And it's made to not get people on these weird tangents where, where things could go out of control. So that's, that's the next thing I'm going to start to read is some of those to get a feel for what those adventures feel like. Um, so I've been, I've been very studious. You should be very proud of me. I'm very proud. Dungeons and Dragons at the next one up club superstars meetup. You, are, you <laughs> as the dungeon master, let's go. Yeah. We'll just do a, a hundred person game. We're going to Fortnite this thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to work guys. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. Packed games we're playing. So the game we're not playing, we should say cyberpunk. We are not playing oh. cyberpunk and that, that speaks to how strong the stranglehold that Baldur's Gate has on us. Because I am experiencing major FOMO seeing people like, oh my God, Cyberpunk's like an entirely yeah. new game. Like, I liked Cyberpunk the first time. I'd be so pumped to play like a, a, a maxed out, like improved version of that. But I'm not gonna until I finish Stay Baldur's Gate. Stay focused. Stay focused. It's not easy. It, it is not easy, but I, I, will, I will do it. Well, that is the games that we are playing. Let's get into some news. So I think you were traveling when this big Xbox leak happened. Also traveling is one Mr. Phil Spencer, who was uh, in Tokyo for Tokyo Game Show, I believe, maybe had one of the all-time bad mornings to wake up to this. Wow. Oh, my God. It must have been the worst. It, you know how sometimes we complain about how we get emails from Japan in the middle of the night and you wake up to like a really bad morning? A nightmare. This is like a million times worse. I cannot believe this. Poor Phil. Um, but yes, I was traveling. I've been trying to keep up with all the bits and bobs that were big headlines out of this massive leak. But uh, catch me up. What has happened? Well, so I, so I, there's so much to this. That's the thing. It's like it's impossible to cover it all. So in our little in our little shared doc here, I've written down five things. Why don't you tell me like two or three that you want to talk about? Because we can't talk about it all. I want to talk about obviously Microsoft's desire to buy Nintendo because that's okay. always juicy. Um, and yeah. obviously we've you know we've been at Nintendo when these rumors have happened before so yeah all right well let's let's start with that then so yeah there's this email where phil is responding to somebody else who i believe is another executive and they're sort of talking about the possibility of buying nintendo and this was really you know from a couple of years ago this is really the time where you know the acquisitions were their big strategy and they were saying you know, we've got these opportunities with um, Bethesda, and I think they were talking about Warner Brothers as another target, but they were, you know, talking about the potentially of aiming even higher. Now, I think some of the coverage of this has gotten a little out like of control yeah. because he even, I mean, he even talks about the reasons why, like, yeah, we can't do this now. Like, this isn't going to happen. He does sort of hint at like, well, maybe in the future, like maybe, you know, there's these ways that we can conv convince them that their best future is off of their own hardware. But there's there's no indication of like, yeah, let's get the deal. right, Let's get the deal and, and let's present it to them tomorrow. There's none of that. Right. He's more so like spitballing ideas. Like it's, it's almost like a hypothetical discussion of like all the options versus it being like a serious thing that they were going to formally, you know, propose to Nintendo or, or even beyond the two people that were talking in that email. So, yeah, there, there were two things that stood out to me though. One was, you know, that mention again of, you know, we need to convince them that their best future is off of their own hardware. <clears throat> That's kind of true for Xbox too. If you read like where they seem to be taking things based on the other stuff that's in the leak 
And, and it's kind of where they are now, where they're just trying to get Game Pass onto, um, you know, different places, different services. Like there are some TVs that have Game Pass built mm-hmm. in. Like you do kind of get the sense of like, yeah, they, they do seem to be, <clears throat> you know, moving away from this hardcore console model to where it's just, yeah, Game Pass is as ubiquitous as Netflix. It's on every device, you know, hook up a controller. We'll make we'll make the official Xbox controller. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to do right what, what Stadia and all these other things couldn't do. So it's, it's interesting Mm -hmm. that he points that out for Nintendo, but I think maybe, maybe he is projecting some of his own future into that too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think ironically, this idea of like you having the ability to play your games anywhere was like something that obviously switch really made into reality and now there's a lot of other ideas from other companies, other gaming companies, um, publishers about like how to how to take that idea even further and like what that what does that future look like? So I think it's kind of funny that, you know, while he says maybe Nintendo's future is off of its own hardware, it was it was Switch that sort of kind of codified for people like, hey, this is a thing that we all want is the ability to play our games anywhere in the world. And I'm feeling that more so than ever while I'm on this trip. And, and this is why I I had such a like mind blown, joyful moment when I was able to remote play with my PS5. So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that like, you know, that might be what Microsoft's future is, but you know, it's, it's like kind of started by Nintendo, you know, Nintendo's idea with the switch. So Right. The other thing that this one showed me and, and, you know, and some other examples from the leaks as well, but this one in particular, you do get the sense for the type of emailer that Phil Spencer is. And and Microsoft seems very much like Nintendo, where there's a lot that happens on email, probably because these people who are especially high up are, are trapped in meetings all day long. Like he did not have to explain that in the detail that he did in that yeah. email. Like there are, there are different people who would be like, yeah, not going to happen. Or I'll tell you later. Uh, like he very like this is an email that could take somebody like all all day to write. You know, we know yeah. people who are like that. They're just chipping away at this email. Like he seems to be over explaining and really like getting extremely granular with his explanations in places where he maybe doesn't doesn't need to. So that's just an interesting view into him as a person and a, and as a leader. And I think it's unfortunate in this case that it's getting taken slightly out of context, but that that was one of the big takeaways I had. Yeah, this is an instance where it's the opposite. You know how we always say like this, this meeting should have been an email. It's like, no, this meet, this email should have been a meeting. Um, because that then should you get, have been a meeting. Right? Like you, you get into these issues where, yeah, your your paper trail becomes detrimental to, you know, the privacy of, of the discussions that you're having with somebody. Um, but it is re- very interesting. Uh, you know, I, I do I often see a little tiny bit of similarities between you know, Phil and Reggie sometimes where Reggie was also very detail oriented and he he would always explain to you in threes. So you really understand, you know, the the, the point that he's trying to make. I get the sense that Phil is, is like that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it just goes to show like the type of, like you were saying, the type of leader he is. He's certainly very detail oriented. He, he thinks through all the different scenarios and it's very clearly laid out in great detail in that, in that email. But yeah, Phil, I think it could, I could it should have been a meeting though. <laughs> well, I think he's going to be more careful about what he puts in emails from now on. Just yeah. got a feeling about that. Um, all right. What, what's next in this grab bag? What's, what's catching your eye here? I want to know about the 75% of Xbox series owners have a series S. That's very high. Yes, this was this was a question we were asking ourselves a few weeks ago, and we didn't know, and we couldn't find the facts out there. This is higher than I thought it would be. Actually, I thought maybe yeah. it's fifty fifty. I, I, we know kind of anecdotally, there's a lot of Series S people out there, and we when we count ourselves among those people. But this is a lot higher than I expected. Yeah, um, and i i do go I do go back to that quote or, or, the, or that 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 discussion point from Gamescom where developers were sort of griping of like, Oh, I want to make this Xbox game, but I've got to deal with the series S what a bummer. And it's like, again, this is the Xbox audience. 75% has a series S. 
Yeah, I didn't know this number, so I was very sympathetic to the developers because I was like, oh, it must be hard to have to do, you know, basically double the work to make something, you know, function um, on a Series S. But now that I'm seeing that is 75% of the audience, well, I'll suck it up because if you want to sell your game, <laughs> if you want to sell your game, then I guess you're going to have to do it. I'm so shocked by this, though. I couldn't believe with it. it. With it being so big, I almost wondered, like, well, what, what if – Instead of the Series X being the flagship system, what if they just never had a Series X and said, yeah, the Series S is actually the new Xbox yeah. and we're not chasing the super, super high end. We're kind of taking more of a Nintendo approach and it's Game Pass forward and it's low cost. And that seems to be something that's resonated with a lot of people. Obviously, it was easier to get for a while, but I did think about that alternate reality. Yeah, like we were talking about how one of the things that maybe Xbox struggles with is this like they don't have a clear like what is your like product proposition or unique product proposition is what we say in marketing, right? Um, it's like, what is it? Like, are you chasing the are you playing the power game with PS5? Like it seems like they were with X or are you saying like this is this, you know, really affordable option for and it's going to be your Game Pass machine, which is how you and I use our Xbox. Um, because they couldn't pick a lane, I think it made it like a little bit confusing for people. Like, well, why do I need an Xbox? So it is interesting. Like maybe the, the story wrote itself with 75% of the people just choosing that path of low cost game pass machine. But yeah, I, I would think like if you came out of the gate with a really, you know, strong proposition for what makes you unique and that was it. Like, I wonder if they would have done better in this generation, you know? Because think about this. So right now, you know, a lot of games get made for PlayStation and Xbox because they have similar specs. If you don't have a high-end Xbox, that might make developers think twice of like, oh, well, I could develop, a, a, you know, a less demanding game for and, and focus on Switch and Xbox as my lead platform. Obviously, you could still like make it pretty and, and ship it on PS5, but... I, I do wonder, like, what what would the long lasting ramifications of that be? That's such a fascinating what if of if there was yeah. just a series S. I really have not stopped stopped thinking about that. Yeah, that stat really like really shocked me. Um, okay, the next thing I all right, interested... pick one more here. Okay, okay, I'll pick one more. What is this all new um, digital Xbox Series X redesign? You have a photo. There's a photo, or not a photo, a, a visual. Yeah, this. This was one of the things that got shared the most, maybe because there was a visual of it. That that always helps, you know, obviously make things real. So they're working on this new refresh of the Series X, codenamed Brooklyn. And uh, as they say it, the most powerful Xbox ever, now adorably all digital. Interesting phrasing, adorably. maybe not what I would have gone with, but fine for an internal PowerPoint. And, you know, basically this is, you know, the same guts as the Series X, but it's it's redesigned, it's all digital, it's meant to be, um, you know, more energy efficient, it's got some other sorts of, um, you know, kind of behind the scenes under the hood enhancements, but I think that is the big thing of, you know, presumably you would not have an Xbox ecosystem that has a disk drive, which is interesting. Uh, to look a couple years down the line and and realize that I, I know that you know there's even debates now of like oh it's, if you buy Starfield does it even come with a disc it seems to be where this is going but maybe they're trying to accelerate that faster than people think. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in this. Like I've already gone disc, disc free for PS5. I'm all digital there. I'm a I'm like a digital person though. Like I don't need the I don't need like the you know the physical stuff, but um. Yeah, if they can streamline that, that's pretty interesting, for me at least. Yeah, it is interesting. This price is, is staying the same. So I think there were some fill quotes earlier of, you know, we don't want to have to do price cuts. So if you just sort of put out these kind of rolling enhancements, I guess you can do that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this was supposedly coming out relatively soon. Um, I, I think, you know, with the leaks mostly coming from a couple years ago that they may be revising those dates, um, you know, based on the realities of actually making the thing. But yeah, it seems like that is uh, in the cards for the future. Yeah. Wow. 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 Yeah. I mean, you could spend like literally 
like a week just reading all of the materials and it's a lot of lot of emails so if that's your thing you can you can check those out but <laughs> we have to move on um Mortal Kombat 1 has come out it's a big new game unfortunately neither of us are playing it but there is a Switch version which got some people talking when it was first announced mostly because it was $70 and we talked about this when this was announced as a $70 game saying, well, that better be the best Top Switch notch. version of Mortal Kombat that you can make. Uh, turns out it isn't. Um, IGN has given it a review of 3 out of 10. Um, I watched a lot of the videos on this version because the weird thing is you and I both played the Switch version of the last game and it, it didn't look great, but it was it was perfectly fine. It was very serviceable, yeah. um, very playable you know, and this version, it just seems to have really, really egregious loading times in between all the matches. And the thing that is really not cool is even when you're in a match, there's slowdown. So it feels like you're playing an online game with lag, but yeah. you're just playing like against the computer. Like, right. I don't know how they ship this in this state. Maybe they were just so focused on the other versions. I don't know. I was shocked because, yeah, you're totally right. I, we, You and I both actually quite enjoyed the Switch version of the last Mortal Kombat game. I played through the whole thing. I didn't have any issues. So when I saw these reviews and I saw, like, I mean, there's definitely some, like, just ridiculous screenshot, like, graphic comparisons. I can get past those, honestly. Nobody has an eyelid. <laughs> Everyone has like bug eyes. It's like I have yes, nobody has an yeah. eyelid. Everybody everybody looks like a like a goldfish, which is very weird, whatever. I mean, I can get past all that. It's not ideal, obviously, but I can get past it. Um, but the gameplay stuff though, that's unacceptable. That's absolutely unacceptable. And we didn't see any of that for the for the other version. So I I do wonder like what happened and what transpired to to, to get them to the state. But I am also very happy because you kept telling me you should get it on Switch for your trip. You should get it. I'm so glad I didn't pay $70. I didn't know. I'm so glad that I did not pay $70 for this. I would have been so mad if I paid that much money and this game was this janky. I would have been so mad. <laughs> the other thing that's interesting is, so Ed Boon is out there and he has a quote. And he seems to have been like caught off guard by this. And he was like, oh yeah, yeah, if there's any problems, we'll be fixing them. It was like, Ed, Ed, did you not play this version? Did you not see this? Um, this this does not bode well for the future of these $70 multi-platform games if if there's just gonna be zero effort put into them. Yeah, that's pretty I mean, that that's just pretty embarrassing, honestly. Yeah, so that's that's just a bummer. Our last story is about TGS, and it seems like a good time. I uh, wish we could be there. Um, Final Fantasy VII seems like the big game alongside Dragon's Dogma that people are really excited to play, but there was some news around Like a Dragon that's worth talking about. So we have Like a Dragon Gaiden coming November 9th. Wow, that's soon. Um, on date on Game Pass. That game is look. I didn't realize that game was coming out in November. I've got to be honest. Yeah, that's that definitely is not the date that I had in mind for sure. So great. That I'm, one. I that love one snuck games. up on me. Yeah. Yeah, I'll need to find a way to squeeze that one in. And then we have Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth coming January twenty sixth, which is really soon after Gaiden. My gosh. But the the voice acting though. I want to talk about the voice acting. <laughs> well, we have Danny Trejo and Daniel Day Kim <laughs> doing the voice cast, which. I think that's I cool, but this is a series where I I really do want to play it in Japanese, so I don't know what I'm going to do. It's kind of strange, but this game is zany. If you're running naked out of a bathhouse through the streets, then we can have Danny Trejo as a voice cast. So let's see what where it goes. Let's see where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he is in Hawaii this time, so there would be more languages being spoken but i, I don't yeah. know i think i'm probably going to stick with the original japanese voice for this but yeah you know the the, the proximity of the dates it, it reminds me when we had um pokemon the pokemon remakes and then pokemon legends arceus yeah. kind of within the span of like a couple months i guess this is like two and a half months um it's a lot it's a lot of like a dragon it's a lot of like a so dragon, yeah. i, I I think there's enough of a window there for people to not get, you know, tired of it or or 
you know, still be on the first game by the time the next one comes out, but they're kind of trying to thread that needle. Maybe they're different enough too, where it's like you're, you're getting right. a different vibe, you know? So, I mean, I'm yeah, a fan, yeah. so I'll, I'll, I'm on board. I'm on board. I am too, but um, yeah, that, but that and Final Fantasy and Dragon's Dogma were kind of the big three takeaways I had from, from TGS this year, but it seems like everybody's having a good time, so it's nice to see that show come back. We are on to our questions from the community. We've got a smaller uh, group today, but they're all good. And our first one is from Gartooth, who asks, in the recent podcast, I think you each mentioned this could have been the last direct focused only on the Switch with the next console possibly releasing next summer. I was curious what the reasoning was behind your speculation of summer for the launch of Switch 2 when a lot of people seem to think Nintendo would target a holiday launch since that's when the new game consoles generally release. Is there any specific strategic reason or advantage for why Nintendo would target a launch before the holidays? Yeah. Yeah. We talked about this a little bit before. Um, You know, Switch obviously did not launch during the holiday time frame. It launched in March. Um, We do feel pretty strong about a non-holiday launch, especially a launch um, in the summertime, because Nintendo has learned a really good lesson, I think, with Switch. And we saw that, obviously, firsthand because we were working on that hardware where you actually don't want your first big launch, you know, your first hardware big big thing to be in the holiday season because it's hard to get the stock all figured out. Um, and a good sort of library of games all ready to go by holiday. So I think what they're going to be doing is similar to Switch where they use uh, the months leading up to the holiday as like a ramp up. So if the Switch com- the Switch 2 comes out during the holiday, during the, summer- during the summertime, they would have a couple of months um, to ramp it up where they would have a really good library of games um, already ready to go. And then they have enough uh, stock for people to buy it. So when you do get to the holiday, then everything is like available. And then you have um, all of the, your, your big uh, marketing messages around like all the games that are already, you know, on switch to or whatever. And then you you announce probably another big holiday game to really cap it off and then you have you have a hit, I think. So that that is why, you know, the speculation around summer is what we've been talking about. And yeah, I feel pretty strongly about that, honestly. I think it's gonna happen in the summer. Yeah, you nailed it. I mean, that mystique of you have to launch in the holidays is is smashed to pieces now with the switch. And you can basically have two big spikes of sales, one when it comes out, and then one when we get to the holidays, because it's going to sell out in the holidays. It just, it just is. So you might as well get, get, get some more and, and take some time to bank some stock for the holiday too. Bruce Dash is next. Does Nintendo ever look at online petitions pertaining to them or their games in some way? And if so, does the number of signatures garner enough attention for them to consider it or at the very least have an internal discussion about it? Yeah, this one reminds me very strongly of the online petition Operation Rainfall. Um, do you remember that? Yeah. So that yeah, one, I sure do. I think was the one that kind of started Nintendo, uh, perking up a bit for online positions, uh, uh, online petitions. Um, I think for that one, there was actually like, um, something that we did about the online petition. I, I believe that we made like a alternate box art for, um, for that game um, as a way to acknowledge the very passionate fan base, Nintendo definitely pays attention to, you know, when these things become huge, um, you know, topics of conversation. But I do think that they there is a limit to like how much they can what they can do about it. They can't do something all the time, but they're definitely listening, I think, and watching and um, seeing what people are talking about. Yeah, people are always aware. And, you know, there, there's a lot of ways for that information to get shared about, you know, do they actually talk seriously about it or, or do you ever get to the case where there's some action taken? Like that's a extremely, extremely high bar. It needs to be so widespread and, you know, beyond a petition that it's just the only conversation happening. So a lot of those movements, frankly, don't get to that point. But there's definitely people who are keeping an eye on it. And if it ever does get to that point, then then yeah, they'll they'll talk about it more. Next question is from Luca Rooney and Rain Tech. We have a tag team. 
Luca Rooney asks, with the announcement of the Nintendo Museum in Japan, how long do you think until we get one somewhere in the U.S.? And then Rain Tech adds, and Europe, we do exist, Nintendo, we do. Yeah, I, I do wonder about that. Um, I don't know if it's easy to do, though, because you might have only one of each item. <laughs> And then how would, yeah. you move it, how would you move it around? I guess if you create some kind of interactive video or, or like a, a oral history that you put in the museum, you could make more of those. But I think it is, it's tough because if it's physical product, like this is the only such and such that exists or the only document of this thing that exists, um, it might just be in Japan. So yeah, I think it's a tough thing to do to make it global. I agree with you. I think there is going to be one of these. And, you know, you may see in the future, like, exhibits travel around the world. They might have a specific exhibit that gets shared with other museums. But, you know, Uji Japan is not a major tourist destination. <laughs> like, you have to go to Kyoto, and then you have to take another train to get to Uji. I think they like it being in their backyard, honestly. Yeah. Because it can be close to them. They can have a high degree of control over it. And the idea of opening globally all these other museums, I don't think is something they're comfortable with. Maybe they maybe they will later on. But to your point, how much stuff do you have? Like, can you really sustain that many, you know, like full on individualized museums? I'm not I'm not sure you can. So I I'm not holding my breath for this to rapidly expand like theme parks did. I don't think so either. I guess we're all going to Uji yeah. Japan. We'll see you there. I've been to Uji. I like it. That is the home of that is the like the capital matcha. of matcha tea. Matcha. So yeah, I've been have there some, too. Have a have some matcha and do your museum. Go to the museum. Walking. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Uh, Riven asks: Scalpers have long been a problem, and I feel like this accelerated once the pandemic set in. I'm very worried about being able to actually procure an Ultra Mega Super Switch Three <laughs> MKU Plus. <laughs> I imagine that as soon as it's announced, it will be sold out due to scalper bots. So I had a bit of an idea and I'd be curious what you think. What if they open pre-orders only for NSO plus expansion pack members first, then NSO members, and then the general public? This would inhibit the ability of scalpers to order dozens or hundreds of units, but would also probably be very ugly from a PR standpoint. It would suck, but it would also help to get the product to people who really want it. What do you think about this strategy? Do you think it's remotely viable possibility? Would the benefits be worth the backlash? Well, I think the good I'm going to say about... for the record, go ahead. I am I am already worried. I am already worried about us being able to get a switch to. We've yeah. had this conversation. You seem less worried than me, but yeah, the, the scalping is such a widespread problem. Yeah, and yes. I, I just, I, I just really worry about being able to jump through all those hoops. Yeah, and I I had low hopes because Nintendo's pre order. Re track record is so terrible um so i'm 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 worried about that you know because nintendo has just never been good about pre-orders they have bad communication about when a pre-order is available and that makes me nervous and i don't want it to be a situation where i'm waiting around for something and then like 20 seconds later it's gone um your idea of it being sort of like NSO expansion members, or I, I think you're, you're, what you're generally saying is that try to um, reward the most passionate Nintendo fans first before you sort of let it go out into the wild and then have these scalpers get it. This idea of like rewarding, you know, the most like dedicated Nin Nintendo fans, I think is really awesome. I don't know if Nintendo would do that. Um, but I do like that idea a lot. And I think that, you know, companies should think about it when they, when they think about pre-orders for like really hot products. I agree. I like the spirit of this idea. You know, Valve did something similar for the Steam Deck where you did have to put down like a couple dollars, which again, just, you know, a bot's not putting down money to get something. So you do have to have a human being do that. It would be a, a bad PR message where it's like, I'm basically, you're forcing me to pay for this expensive thing. So I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but they do. The pre-order, the whole pre-order system is so broken. Like I raised this with the sales team a few times. A lot of, you know, after a lot of the problems with the mini consoles and Amiibo, 
where it's like, why can't we do a better job of like even communicating when something will go live? And there are some tricky realities of how much they can do, like forcing a, a retailer to do. But there's also a reality where it's like, if you're in sales, your job is to make the thing sell and it's selling. So they can't be that worried about it. It's like, well, it's sold out. Right. I did my job. Who like, yeah, yeah, it's yes. hard. It's, it's, it's high demand. That's economics. So <laughs> there's always going to be some sort of push and pull of that. But oh, I, I just, somebody needs to, somebody high up needs to step in and say, this is like a poor consumer experience for nobody to know when a pre-order will happen. For it, for it to be sold out before you even have a fair chance to get something, that's not good. And it just takes, you know, somebody high up really putting their foot down and saying, no, we have to prioritize this or it's never going to happen because like, yeah, it's sold out. G good yeah. news. It's sold out. Yeah. It's just hard. Last question is from Robot Penguin. <laughs> Hi, guys. Do you personally know the current or past English narrator guys for the Nintendo Directs? If so, or or still do, what are they like? We do. We do know them. Um, they're very nice. They're just normal people. They have normal voices. They do not talk like that all the time. Um, but yeah, they're just like regular employees, which is kind of weird. Um, they, they do work in like the uh, production part of Nintendo. We call it Content Lab. Um, but yes, they are just normal, nice, regular people, just like you and I. That's the thing. The person who does the bulk of the narration does not talk like that. That is not his normal voice. And then, you know, there are other people who do narration, like like the voiceover for when a, a developer is speaking. They're from localization and, and they have like a longstanding history with that developer. So they kind of know how they talk. So it, it is cool that there is continuity where it's like, oh, you know, if Mr. Koizumi's talking, it'll usually be this person and, mm -hmm. and kind of go down the line from that. So that, yeah. that is a nice way for them to do it. That is all of our questions. Thank you to everybody who submitted through Patreon. It is time to shout out our Patreon superstars and 1UP Club. We're going to do it a little bit differently just to uh, anticipate any potential lag with the remote recording. We're going to do it in chunks. You're going first. Here we go, superstars. Aaron Hash, Ben Icorn, Maru Mayhem, Eigenverse, Kiss My Flapjack, Mike Chin, Roy Eschke, Switching it up, underscore, and Cerveza! Pass the baton, VGM Life, Link, the Hero of Winds, Angela Bycroft and her Pig Molly, Turbocharge Nerd, Thomas O'Rourke, Kyle LaBeouf, Christopher Lara, Simon, Frederick Wolf Conradson, Andrew Yuhas, Chili, Brewstache, and Rain Tech. Hey, you had more than me! Oh. Well, well, you got a lot to do here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> in the One Up um, Club. In the One Up Club. <laughs> we're going to the One Up Club graduation service right now. A. Ron Burgundy. Ali Alejandro. Alexandra Pratt. Astro Dev. Awesome 4 T6. Bad Moon Arising. Ben GB. Blue Yellow Gray. Bookum Dano. Brooklishly. Oh, Bookish. Bookishly Fab. Wow. Brad, SF56, Brooke Obscura, Brookie Kazooie, Chelly Squirrel, Christopher Lay, Captain Alex, Crim Cat, C Roper 17, Dachshund, Doinko, Dolce, Dino Punch, Elite Peach, S Farts 50, Fart Pre 69, Furbound, Fernie and Jess Forever, Fox Deploy, Garrett Hallfish, Garth the Wolf, Gartooth, G Sun 101, Heroic, Iris, Iris Marin, J, uh, oh no, oh no, J Rando, J I'm Rando, okay. I'm okay, Jabroni Jones, Jeffrey Hernandez, Jerry 92602, Jesse Hernandez, John Responte, Jonathan Rowe, Jordan Collette, Jordan Hemmerly, Joshua Clements, Chuji Fruit, Jess Camtro, Justin Leminger, Kawa2796, Keith Kwan, Kevin Delane, Kilo Kibo, Chris Yu, and Christopia Party with me! Oh boy, it's my turn. Kyle Gamer Barry Rookie, Kyle Kretzer, Kyler Nelson, Linnell Stickman, Lit, Luminous, Luca Rooney, Mad Dog5981, 
Magnificent Easy G and Callie Marie, Marky Man 64, Mecha Dragon 101, Megan, Michael Cravens, Mikey, Modamania, Mr. Andy Palm, Mr. Beans and Dip, MSM Poke Gamer, Mytran, Nasir, Nameless Hero, Nathan Burkhart, Nick E, Ninja Eleven, Panda Buns, Pangy, Paul C. Pace, Paul Gale Network, Pillimer, Prime Factor, Prince Charmless, Reaver, Renee Rivers, Ryoth One, Rob Osborne, Rocks, Rianetta, Cypher A, Sharif Jackson, Sheer Cold Vanill, Shinryu, Slowbro, Silly Ferret, SJ Sharky Triple Seven, Snazzle, Spicy Munchkin, Steel Citrone, Sunny Gaduru, Terra Storm, The Shark Among Men, Thomas Alvarez, Three Rivers, Topher Schmofer, Travis Torline, Tugs Puppy Bear, Tuscoob, Tyler Goosey, TM, Fess Fess, Video Game Stupid, Viridian, Virtual Bot, Weeb Kingdom, WG Grizzy, Wicked Davy, Will Johnson, Zudaverf, Zelgarov, Zapati, and Zroid. <laughs> Yay! It's a lot harder to do it by ourselves, like when you don't alternate. Don't you think? It's hard. It's it's hard for when you when you said Aaron Burgundy. I'm like, uh, I gotta bite my tongue to not jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm next. I'm up. <laughs> oh my god! It's like the force of habit. All right. Well, this is a wonderful first remote. You, uh, I was gonna say universal. No, global. One day when I'm in Mars and you're on Earth, we'll do a universal. Podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> this is a good uh, first um, global podcast. But uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe to us on Patreon. We're at patreon.com slash Kit and Krista to keep all of this going. Thank you so much. If you are listening on video, you can go ahead and subscribe to this channel. Give us a thumbs up and also leave us a comment. And if you are listening on audio, you can give us a five-star rating. You can also subscribe and leave a written review, please.